I think they fall into both categories, don't they? Extraterrestrial activity, out-of-body experiences, government cover-ups. The perfect mixture for a conspiracy theory. The world first got hysterical about UFOs after the events of the 24th of June, 1947. On a routine flight over Washington State, pilot Kenneth Arnold encountered nine saucer-shaped objects which appeared out of the clouds and flew directly towards him. As reported in local newspapers, Arnold described how these flying saucers zigzagged in and out of formation before flying off at an incredible speed. Although Arnold couldn't identify what he saw, the encounter confirmed that there are things in the sky which cannot be explained. People have been seeing UFOs um, as far back as recorded time. Look at the Middle Ages, for instance. People were seeing things in the sky that they couldn't explain then, but they didn't see them as flying saucers or spaceships. In the 14th and 15th centuries, they interpreted them as flaming swords and shields because they didn't have a spaceship frame of reference to go into. Until 1947, people's sightings of mysterious flying objects were explained as airships, experimental planes and weather balloons. But Kenneth Arnold's saucers changed everything. The world authorities were quite concerned about UFOs or flying saucers because at that time we were in the grip of the Cold War. There was a big schism between Russia and the rest of the Western world and the authorities were very concerned that whatever may be flying around might be considered some form of attack. In Britain too, Winston Churchill, having seen off the Nazis, wondered if the alien threat was real. In private correspondence to his Secretary of State for Air in 1952, Churchill demanded, What does this stuff about flying saucers amount to? What could it mean? What's the truth? Since the Second World War, the Ministry of Defence has repeatedly denied the existence of UFOs. However, Britain's very own Agent Mulder has spoken out and claims to have found the truth, or as close as he can get to it. When I joined the MOD and looked into the old UFO files, it became readily apparent that each year, for many, many years, there have been several hundred UFO sightings reported to the Ministry. I have no doubt, personally, based on my official research and investigation at the Ministry, that a small number of these UFO sightings may well relate to extraterrestrial activity. And I don't say that lightly, I say it on the basis of there being craft in our airspace capable of speeds and manoeuvres way beyond anything that we've got in our inventory. Nick Pope believes an incident that happened 20 years ago may well be the closest Britain has got to an alien encounter. The event is known as the Rendlesham Forest Incident. Although the pictures are reconstructed, the voices are real. There's no doubt about it, just some type of strange flashing red light of yours. Weird. It's coming this way. It is definitely coming this way. It's your pants that are shining off. There's no doubt about it. This is weird. In the early hours of Boxing Day 1980, a strange light was seen over Rendlesham Forest in Suffolk. Staff at nearby NATO airbase RAF Bentwaters tracked the UFO as it crashed into the trees. A patrol of American servicemen was sent to investigate. The guard patrol encountered a landed metallic craft. There were indentations on the forest floor. They ran a Geiger counter around these indentations. They found the levels of radiation were ten times what they should have been for the area concerned. Only the military knew about the incident. 
The public knew nothing until 1983, when a former airbase security guard, who'd been on that eventful patrol, spoke to BBC News. This thing came down, the red light over it, and sat there maybe two seconds. It was just a ball of light in the air, maybe 20 feet off the ground, 30 feet, and it dispersed in a multitude of colors. And they all seemed to fall on top of this thing. And before our eyes, it's almost indescribable, but there was a, a craft, an alien spacecraft. Some people saw lights in the sky, some people saw something very much more involved than that, uh, a landed craft. Now, I have no doubt that this is an absolutely extraordinary case, and really, so far as uh, the evidence in Britain is concerned, poses the, the strongest case yet for there being an extraterrestrial explanation for the UFO phenomenon. However, the Ministry of Defence takes a different line. It states the incident posed no significant threat and was therefore not worth investigating. But this still doesn't tell us what actually happened. Theories range from NATO manoeuvres to Martian intruders. UFO researcher Jenny Randalls has spent 20 years investigating the case. She believes she has uncovered the truth about that night. The Rendlesham Forest case is undoubtedly the most complex UFO investigation that I've ever been involved in. It's the most notorious and talked about incident in Britain. After World War II, a lot of covert radar-based experiments were set up here. During the 1970s, we know that there was some sort of a, an attempted experiment to perfect a super powerful radar system which sends very powerful beams of energy right out into space and bounces them back off the ionosphere. Um, Unfortunately, what was discovered as a side effect of that kind of research was that um, these beams caused odd things to happen in the atmosphere. They caused the atmosphere to glow because they created plasma effects in and around them. They created all kinds of severe physiological effects on people who got too close to them. The odds are pretty high that one of these experiments was underway at the time when this particular incident occurred and these people just happened to get trapped within the energy field. I suspect a degree of cover-up was, was mounted to try and obscure the um, uncomfortable consequences of admitting the kind of research that was going on there. But Nick Pope is adamant this incident was not a military experiment, but one that had all the hallmarks of a UFO. Some two weeks after the incident, a report was made by the United States Air Force to the British Ministry of Defence um, describing this in terms of a UFO incident. Uh, the government and the military are not in the business of telling lies to people. But the authorities try to ensure that whatever happened in Rendlesham Forest, it remained secret. We were threatened by the government, government agencies. They were not military people. We were interrogated. We met with some people and they, the basic feeling and the basic thing they said to us is that no one will believe you, first off. So go on with your lives, go about your lives, live the most normal life you can and forget it. Uh, if you make it hot under the collar for us, uh, Uncle Sam supplies bu ample bullets and bullets are cheap and they didn't actually say they would kill us, but they actually put their point across that they would use force if necessary. So, the book on Britain's closest encounter of the third kind remains well and truly closed. Well, our Clive Anderson examines the moon landing next. Was it a hoax? That's coming up after the conclusion of Aliens. Stay with UK TV people. Nevada. Heart of ufology and hotbed of conspiracy theories. Groom Lake, 80 miles northwest of Las Vegas. Many conspiracy theorists believe not only does the government know about aliens, it works alongside them at this military complex. Better known as Area 51, the base covers 4,000 square miles and is patrolled by armed guards with a license to kill. Public access 
is strictly forbidden. Area 51 was started in 1955. It was a joint venture between the CIA and Lockheed Martin Skunk Works. At first to develop the U-2 spy plane. From there, they went on to develop the SR-71 Blackbird. And what they needed was a secure location out in the middle of the wilderness, which uh, Area 51 was ideal. It's out in the middle of the desert with hardly nothing around it. Donald Emery spends much of his time monitoring what goes on around the base, but admits it's difficult finding out what really happens inside. It actually took them 40 years to actually claim that there was a site out there. Uh, it was 1995 when they actually said that there's an operating facility near Groom Lake. And of course, that's for now, that's the only thing they've ever said. Although the Area 51 base is not named on any map, it does show up on this Russian satellite photograph. Because of all the secrecy, um, people come up with all kinds of ideas of what they're doing out there, simply because we don't know. Some people speculate that there's actually some kind of trading agreement going on where the aliens actually traded saucers or technologies to the Americans. In 1996, a man spoke to the BBC who claims to have worked inside Area 51. Better still, he claims to have been inside an alien craft. The emotions, the feeling that I felt inside uh, when I first entered the craft are quite different from what you'd expect. It's a very ominous feeling, um, a feeling as if you you shouldn't be there. I, I know that sounds kind of corny, but that that, that is truly truly how I felt. Electronics engineer Bob Lazar told the BBC he joined a highly secretive team whose job it was to duplicate and remake the engines of alien craft stored at Area 51. The propulsion system is quite exotic. It's a gravity propulsion system. There's no propeller, there's no jet exhaust, there's no, no obvious mode of propulsion. The first time I saw the disc fly, it lifted virtually silently off the ground. We're looking at something about 52 feet in diameter, just hovering silently in the air. It drifted over to the left, to the right, and then set back down. Pretty uneventful test, but it was uh, quite impressive. Lazar claimed that he worked not only Area 51, he said he was transferred to another location south of Area 51 called S4. And he said inside the mountain there, which is totally concealed, that's actually where they pack engineer alien spacecraft. Um, supposedly there's alien bodies there. Now, I, I'm not, again, going to discredit that claim because I can't prove that it's not true. But to, to what we've come up with, our research done, it merely looks like an advanced aircraft design and energy weapon test facility uh, no aliens, UFOs. They will make up reports to misbelieve, misdirect people in other thinking. Um, there's definitely a conspiracy there because if it's just advanced aircraft, they have to lie about it. So at least that our enemies won't know about it. There will actually be people out there hunting for aliens when they may actually just be looking at advanced aircraft. It's no wonder that UFO conspiracies thrive around military bases. The ingredients are all there. High levels of secrecy, advanced weapon testing, energy pulses in the sky. But when there's talk of alien activity in the innocent countryside, rational explanations aren't quite so easy to come by. Oliver's Castle, Wiltshire, 1989. There's a couple of lights down there somewhere. This controversial film appears to show strange objects hovering above a cornfield. Below, complex circle formations appear. Retired electrical engineer Colin Andrews is now a self-styled crop circle investigator. He believes they can't be explained away as a force of nature. 
there are features which we can't easily account for. Uh, plants that are changed at the cellular anatomic level, bent where they shouldn't be bent. Plants that are subtle when they shouldn't be. Uh, plants that bend and should break, but do not. Colin Andrews first came across these strange shapes in 1983. I was driving between offices in Andover and Hampshire across to Petersfield. I glanced to my left and saw these circles, perfect circles, in a field of wheat. He soon discovered there were many more. I began uh, to make some inquiries that particular night of the landowner as to how he thought they might have arrived there. I began to tap doors of farmers in that area and I, I made um, inquiries of the police and the Ministry of Defence and I, I was already very quickly forming a picture that uh, these were not the only ones here. So clearly there was um, a, a wider um, mystery um, phenomenon than that that I saw in that field. So, is this the footprint of extraterrestrial life? They signify something. There's information encoded in them. And the circle in itself is a very, is a universal symbol, very important symbol, signifies everything. So have intelligent life forms traveled millions of miles to trample on corn? There is, of course, another explanation. We always work in pretty much in the dead of night. And we enter into the field very, very carefully and very, very stealthily. We use the tractor lines to walk up to the field. We don't step across virgin crop. We don't leave trails. Using nothing more than a measuring tape and a plank of wood or stalk stomper, the hoaxers set about their work. We work very tightly to um, diagrams which are obviously uh, worked up beforehand and something called a construction sequence, which is kind of key to making sure that everybody's in the right place at the right time. There's definitely a symbiotic relationship between ourselves as the suppliers of the phenomena and those that, that, that have a demand, that need the phenomena. Um, sometimes their need is a very casual one as a visitor or tourist to this region. Um, and on, in other cases, their need is a very, um, a very intense one and it's one that revolves around beliefs and conspiracies about where, they, where the circles originate from. But in either case, we, we you know, fulfill that need really you know, in, in our own way. In summer 2000, there were over 120 reported circles in southern England, most put down to hoaxes. I think what we're looking at is, is approximately 80% or so of the patterns uh, that are appearing around the English countryside uh, are man-made. I don't think there's any question that 10-15% uh, or so is a real phenomenon. But, as the conspiracy theorist would have us believe, not only are aliens leaving evidence in our crops, they're also leaving their mark on our animals. In September 1967, something strange happened on a ranch in Colorado. It was the start of one of the most sinister mysteries in modern ufology, a phenomenon that seemed to defy all rational explanation. In a report to a local newspaper, farmer Burl Lewis described how one of his prize horses, Snippy, had been found dead and mutilated. The flesh had been stripped from her neck with such precision that it looked like a surgeon had done it. And there was another strange twist. Snippy's tracks seemed to stop a hundred feet short of where she finally lay. But this was not an isolated case. Since the 1960s, specifically in America, farmers and people living in rural areas have begun to find uh, animals that have been killed. They've had uh, parts of the body, ears, uh, rectums, vaginas, other, other soft tissue parts that have been carefully and surgically removed. In every state in the United States, in every province in Canada, just if you took North America over 40-some years, you've, you're in thousands. Intrigued by the mystery, investigative reporter Linda Moulton Howe has spent the past 20 years trying to find out who is responsible for these disturbing animal deaths. I have talked with ranchers where they've had mutilations. They know what predation is. They know what disease is. And in some cases, they've had satanic cults. 
take animals and plunge knives into them. This, this is not like this. These are all so neat and so pristine and so perfect, and that's what spooks people. In many cases, farmers report seeing mysterious beams of light flying around mutilation sites. Evidence of extraterrestrials, according to this eyewitness in Texas. I saw this big black cow laying down with its mouth, and I said, my God, they got a cow. But what are they doing to it? Within one month of the very first phone calls, conversations with sheriffs, with uh, ranchers, fellow journalists who had been in the story, what I was hearing was, I won't talk to you in front of the camera, but this is what I know. They confirm, at least from their first-hand knowledge point of view, that the government of the United States has known since the mid-1950s that what they call extraterrestrial biological entities are interacting with our planet and that the unusual deaths are the target of this non-human intelligence. And so a scenario common to all conspiracy theories pops up. People claim that the governments, the American government in particular, turn a blind eye to what's going on out in the prairies. This is possibly the conspiracy th theory taken to its highest degree because there's no evidence whatsoever at all for this. Yet again, it allows people to, to look at the authority figure, the government, and to say, you know what's going on, but you won't tell us. One thing that I am very sure about um, is the issue of, of whether there is any cover-up uh, with regard to the UFO issue. And I can say, as somebody who has now been a civil servant in the Ministry of Defence for 15 years, three years of which were actually spent on the UFO desk, handling this data day by day, there is no cover-up, there is no conspiracy. So, in the absence of concrete evidence of genuine UFO encounters or government cover-ups, what is the truth about the UFO conspiracy? I think the, the modern belief in ufology has arisen because we live in um, a post-industrial age, we live in a post-religious age, we live in a post-nuclear age, and people are desperate for something to believe in, some form of uh, divine intervention, if you like, something other than what's going on on Earth. And the subject of UFOs, extraterrestrials, life on other planets, and so on, gives people that hope. It gives them the hope that there is something out there that is bigger and more than we have here on Earth. It's worth noting that for more than 40 years, scientists have been beaming messages out into the galaxy in the hope of attracting an intelligent answer. As yet, no one has picked up the phone. Nigel Slater and his real food is over on UK TV Food. Get over there for good grub, but if it's a good old conspiracy theory you're after, stay here for more. Next, Clive Anderson is investigating the moon landing. Well worth watching. That's over on Jisoo from 9 tomorrow. Back with your Saturday night UK TV people. We're heading into outer space now with Clive Anderson. For eight days in July 1969, the biggest TV audience ever watched as man conquered the final frontier. Neil Armstrong and the crew of Apollo 11 concluded America's epic struggle to get a man on the moon. We feel that this stands as a symbol of the insatiable curiosity of all mankind to explore the unknown. But there's another story, a story of conspiracy cover-ups, and even culpability.
I watched the small step and the giant leap, and I thought, this is fantastic stuff. This is amazing. Man has landed on the moon. I thought, that's what I'm watching. It must be true. But did it actually happen the way we've been shown? Or is there a darker side to the Apollo mission? According to one conspiracy, NASA couldn't actually get to the moon, so all missions were faked. Rather than climbing aboard their rockets, the astronauts were taken to a secret film studio deep in the Nevada desert. Here, the moon landings were staged and filmed before the footage was transmitted back to Houston and on to a gullible world. Tell me if you got a picture, Houston. Well, we got a beautiful picture, Neil. Now, whether what we were watching were simulation exercises being transmitted as the real event, it's a possibility which needs to be examined. It needs to be examined closely because this is one of the great historical scientific achievements of any age. In the years running up to Armstrong's lunar landing, the United States had been caught up in a bitter space race with its Cold War rival, the Soviet Union. For a long time, the Soviets looked like they were winning the race. They had beaten the Americans with the first satellite in 1957, the first lunar probes in 1959, the first dog in space in 1960. To cap it all in 1961, Soviet Colonel Yuri Gagarin became the first man in space. According to the conspiracy, in its quest for top dog status, America needed to get a man on the moon before the Soviets, whatever the cost. It was important diplomatically and politically and economically for the world to see American technology as superior. The Russian space efforts had threatened that. And throughout the 60s, there was a great deal of concern that Russian success in space would affect the world attitudes toward Russian technology, Russian military power, and who was going to be ahead 20, 30, 40 years in the future. Major Gagarin. If indeed the space flight was a symbol of the future, Russian success there could be translated very directly into Russian success on Earth and Earth diplomacy. As if to reinforce the point, President Kennedy put his name behind the moon mission. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long range exploration of space. So this was a prestige project. There was no project that carried a greater penalty for failure or reward for success. Everybody knew what success had to be. It had to be a picture of a man on the moon. Or it had to be what we would believe would be a picture of a man on the moon. But could the Americans make it? Believers in the hoax theory are convinced that they couldn't. According to one former NASA contractor, there was a human cost in the rush to get to the moon. This was brought out by the death of Grissom, Chafee and White in 1967, when the three men were burned to death in a command capsule. NASA was indeed found culpable for the deaths of three of its best astronauts. Gus Grissom, Roger Chaffee and Ed White died in a flash fire during routine launch testing. Gus Grissom was about to blow the whistle on the whole project. 
He found that nothing really worked right. He was very unhappy with the Apollo project. On the day that he was killed, he hung a, a lemon on the command capsule indicating what he thought of the whole project. Modifications were made to the spacecraft and the moon program resumed. But there are those who believe that NASA still didn't have what it took to get men on the moon. They could not technologically fulfill Kennedy's promise that we'd land a man on the moon by the end of the decade. So in order to retain the prestige of American industry throughout the world, they had to fake it. Probably a thousand, two thousand, three thousand other journalists covered the step by step build up, the construction of the facilities at the Kennedy Space Center, the development of the Apollo spacecraft in Houston, Texas, and here in California. There were so many witnesses to this event, let alone the 18 men who went to the moon. There's no way you could, you could develop a hoax around that. NASA's photographic records of the moon landings hold the clues to this conspiracy. TV producer David Percy has spent years examining the photographs. He's convinced he's found evidence of a hoax. The Apollo photographs are faked. They're encoded also with what appears to be deliberate mistakes. He claims there are continuity errors between the photographs and the TV images. In this example, the astronaut jumps into the air and reaches the peak of his jump. His colleague takes a snap. There is a triangle of fabric that should be absolutely secure and motionless that has flapped up from the top of the portable life support system. In the TV freeze frame, we can see this triangular flap is correctly fastened and is therefore not visible. It is not flapped up. But is this evidence that the moon landing was filmed in a studio? Now, looking at this picture, the rock over to the left of the screen has the letter C marked on it. Why should there be a letter of the English alphabet stamped onto a rock on the moon's surface? Surely we are looking at the deliberate planting of props in a pre-designated position in the foreground of a photographic film set. It is said that for every hour spent in space, five hours were spent rehearsing on Earth. Of course they did that, and that was no secret. It was no secret that photographs and films were taken of models of the lunar surface. It worked as a simulation. Nobody else had been there. Nobody knew the difference. Columbia, Columbia, this is Houston, ALS, over. It's worth noting that during the Apollo 11 mission, NASA omitted to get any photographs of Neil Armstrong, the first man on the moon. All the shots are of co-pilot Buzz Aldrin. Would NASA have made such a PR blunder if everything had been staged in a studio? The search for conspiracies is the search for explanation. And in many cases, in many mysteries, a conspiracy is a, is a very plausible first hypothesis. You then have to look beyond that and find out what really happened and research, talk to people, talk to technology, see what was, what was physically possible. How is the quality of the TV? For any hoax to succeed, you must control access to the information. Now, there were several hundred thousand men and women who worked on the Apollo machines. And for all these people to have worked on the hoax and not come forward means that they probably had to have been killed. You couldn't kill that many people and keep it hidden. Well, Clive Anderson examines more serious conspiracies next, this time tackling Waco and the Oklahoma bombings. That's at 10 after the moon landing. <laughs> But in conspiracy theory, the stories are often stranger than fiction. Looks like another of their patriots. Are you there? 
Another one. There is a theory that although man landed on the moon, what was found up there was so shocking that NASA had no alternative but to keep it hidden. In a story that first appeared in a Canadian tabloid newspaper in 1971, Armstrong and Aldrin found alien spaceships on the moon. This is a transcript of Armstrong's alleged conversation with Mission Control. These babies are huge, sir. Enormous. Oh, God, you wouldn't believe it. What's there? Mission Control calling Apollo 11. I'm telling you, there are other craft out there lined up on the far side of the crater edge. They're on the moon watching us. Uh, that was purely fictitious. You can tell it's fictitious because the jargon is not NASA. The conversations are not NASA. You can look and see terms in there like Hello Earth or Hello America or Calling Mission Control that no one in space has ever used. Yet despite that obvious hoax, in 1991 a cable TV station manager in Vancouver intercepted a series of transmissions beamed back to Earth from the orbiting space shuttle. The tapes have since been examined by British UFO chasers Graham Birdsell and Russell Callaghan. They believe this is proof that astronauts have seen UFOs. Here you had an object just below the Earth horizon traveling along when suddenly there's a flash to, uh, to port or the left-hand side of the shuttle. Um, the object makes um, an incredible right angle maneuver, goes back more or less from whence it came, and to missile type streaks are seen left and right. We can see patently clear on the footage that it was an intelligently controlled spacecraft. Well, what we must remember, Graham, as well, is that these shots are they're there. They, these are framed shots. Somebody's watching this particular area of space. And as you watch what happens, you get the feel that whatever's happening has been expected. The irony here is that those who accuse NASA of a cover-up are themselves covering up facts to make their story look more real. Yet NASA's own planetary photographs have led some to wonder whether there is life in space. In photographs widely available to the public, geologists have found rock formations on the surface of the moon that some believe to be artificial. I might mention first of all that on, uh, so far I've found 44 sites on the moon that I uh, suspect or have confirmed anomalies. Amateur geologist Steve Troy has spent the last six years looking at NASA's moon photographs. During his extensive research, he claims to have found evidence of an alien base lying deep inside a lunar crater. There's all the geology that uh, you would see around an impact crater that size. But you also see orthogonal, geometric, buttressed lunar ruins around the flank of the crater. One particular object is a structure called the rampart, which is about five miles long. In addition to this eight-sided structure, Troy claims to have found the remains of glass domes, relics of a larger settlement. The things that we're seeing on the moon are, you know, remnants of something that used to be much, much bigger. I believe it's artificial. I don't believe it's natural. So, did the astronauts accidentally stumble across moon bases, structures built by aliens? Astronomer Patrick Moore, who was part of the team that originally mapped the moon back in the 1960s, thinks that all this talk of aliens and moon bases may be a little far-fetched. One thing you've got to remember, when you hear conspiracy theory, that is the hallmark of the crackpot. I've been looking at the moon all my life, through some of the world's best telescopes, with my moon mapping days, and since, of course, and now with the space pictures. We know every facet of the moon, yeah, maps of the entire surface, craters, mountains, ridges, valleys, and nothing we can't explain. Okay, uh, Houston, the moon is essentially gray. <coughs> no color. Looks like plaster of Paris. They are uh, sort of a grayish beach. Still, there are question marks. 
Ken Johnson worked as head of NASA's data and photo control department. It was his responsibility to check films that came back from the moon. While working in the lab, he came across technicians who, he says, were deliberately altering lunar photographs. There were a group of three people sitting around a light table about the size of a card table. And there were two men and one, one lady. Uh, when I, I noticed that they had film and negatives out on the, uh, on, the, uh, on the light table, and they had very fine little paintbrushes, and they were painting black, uh, blacking out parts of the negatives. And I, I asked them, I said, well, what, are you, what are you folks doing? And one of the gentlemen quipped very quickly, he says, we're professional strippers. Uh, the lady kind of laughed, and she said, well, actually, what we are doing is we are stripping uh, by painting along the surface of the horizon to paint out any stars so it won't be confusing. Although this form of retouching is commonplace in photo labs, Ken Johnston believes the NASA technicians were removing any evidence of alien bases. On another occasion, the same form of retouching was carried out on a roll of film. During the showing of that particular reel, we came up on the crater, you could see a cluster of about five lights. Uh, today I'd probably refer to them as, as domes, five dome clusters of lights. Such an amazing discovery stuck in his mind, but not as much as what happened the next day when he showed the film to other scientists. The film goes right past the crater. There's no evidence of any lights or any steam, nothing at all. So it seems, someone was trying to hide the truth about what was on the moon. I've heard it said that NASA have kept back images of artifacts. Well, I've never heard that rubbish in my life. Why should they do that to start with? Certainly you couldn't do it, well, because our pictures are far too detailed. And uh, as I say, there are some people who will try and make, make something out of nothing. And that's what these people do, I fear. But they say it's quite harmless. All this talk of bases on the moon was nothing compared to what they found on Mars. In 1976, NASA's Viking 1 probe sent back pictures from Mars that added new weight to the theory of life elsewhere in the galaxy. One set of images in particular attracted scientists' attention. Deep in the Cydonia region in Mars's northern hemisphere, the Viking probe photographed what appeared to be an image of a human face. Scientists still debate about what was found on Mars, but Mark Colotto, an imaging analyst for the US government, is under no illusions. When I first looked at the picture, it was, was very clearly a humanoid face. Um, but what was more striking to me was the context. There were these what appeared to be very geometrical, angular-looking objects nearby. In addition to the face, Mark Colotto has identified on the Mars photographs what he says are pyramids, ramparts, and even a complex known as the city. We're talking about structures that are millions, perhaps a half a billion years old, not thousands of years old. To further his argument that these aren't simply tricks of the light or optical illusions, Colotto has further enhanced the images using computer technology. What I've done that I think has been different from what other people have done is to try to understand these objects in particular with face in three dimensions. In order to do this I've had to reconstruct the shape of it using computer vision techniques. What if the sun was in a different position in the sky? What if we were looking at the object from a different vantage point? I uh, proved very conclusively that over a wide range of uh, viewing conditions it still looked like a face. NASA remains unconvinced of his findings. To back this up, the Global Surveyor mission in 1997 sent back greatly enhanced images of the Martian surface. These showed the face to be nothing more than a pile of rocks, a conclusion many geologists seem happy to agree with. 
one of the things that many scientists, myself included, have done is looked at these images of the face on Cydonia, the images taken by Viking, and thought, crumbs, yes, it does look very much like a, a, a face. But then when the next set of images come of exactly the same region, but the sun happens to be in, at a different angle, you can see quite clearly from those images that it's not a face. Soon after its formation in 1957, NASA commissioned a report to consider the possible consequences of the discovery of life in outer space. It concluded that any such discovery should be kept from the public for fear of mass panic. Conspiracy theorists say this is proof that we were never going to be told the truth about the exploration of space. It could have been decided that it was far safer to adopt the surrogate program and produce to the world representation of this great achievement of mankind. When you look at the evidence, when you look at what we've discovered, and we look at the fact that it's been withheld, you have to come to the conclusion that there has to be some group that is steering uh, the evidence release to the public. What we see is a story of management, space management, for public consumption. And that's what's happened. So we're given spoon-fed information that is pre-digested so we don't choke on it but in the future especially as space travel becomes a reality for more of us can the truth about what is out there always be kept from us Well, this is UK TV, and next here on UK TV, people, Clive Anderson gets to grips with more conspiracy theories, or if you're peckish, try UK TV food and some lush ice cream in Nigel Slater's Real Food. Or on UK TV Style Next, another seriously extreme makeover awaits. Well, yes, it is at 7 tomorrow, but you can see it all day, too. They didn't tell you that, did they? Watch Top Gear from 9am here on UK TV People. Now, though, we ask, was there political involvement in some of the world's worst disasters? TWA 800, Oklahoma, Waco. Almost 500 deaths in three major US disasters. Genuine accidents or political cover-ups? A question asked by some skeptical Americans who believe the blame for the tragedies can be traced straight to the heart of the US government. 87 people are now believed to have died in Armenian religious sect at Waco, Texas. 48 bodies have been recovered from the ruins so far. The White House said the fire was started deliberately by those inside after the FBI began at dawn. The question of who started the Waco fire remains open to debate. Mount Carmel had been the headquarters of a religious group called the Branch Davidians. Led by David Koresh, they were a breakaway section of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and believed that the apocalypse was imminent. A Justice Department inquiry blamed the cult members for starting the fire, but there's still a belief that it was deliberately started by US federal agents to destroy evidence that could be used against them. An unusual twist to the story. The background that people usually focus on is that Koresh was a religious man who was on the fringes of religious belief and he was heavily armed because he believed that Armageddon was just around the corner. Well, a couple of things about that. To be heavily armed in Texas is not illegal and it's not actually particularly unusual. And his religious beliefs were his religious beliefs. The Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms suspected David Koresh was keeping weapons and explosives stockpiled at his compound. By February 1993, the Bureau had a warrant for his arrest. 
in what would be a very public display of law enforcement, the ATF decided to mount a spectacular raid. But the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms at that time was under a great deal of political pressure. There was talk of streamlining the government and maybe getting rid of ATF. They were desperate to find something they could do which would be headline grabbing and would prove that ATF was still necessary. Wait. The raid was a fiasco. David Korosh had been tipped off that the ATF were on their way. When the armed agents arrived, the Branch Davidians met them fully armed. One morning the Davidians looked out and there were 75 armed men charging their house. And they thought, ah, it's the army of Babylon come to attack God's people. And they resisted. With six people dead, four ATF agents and two cult members, both sides retreated and prepared for a standoff. The Waco rumor mill sprang into action. It was a shambles, an absolute shambles. It was handled appallingly. They had cameras rolling to record this. They planned on having a big public relations uh, soiree with it. Helicopters were used and that became an issue. Then it became an issue of who fired first. Miraculously, all these cameras uh, had the lens caps on or the tapes weren't in them. Key evidence that would prove who shot first has all disappeared. The government fired through doors. Could not see who was behind those doors. Conspiracists say that this was an attempt to kill anybody who was inside there, women and children included. What was the great crime that Koresh was supposed to have committed that would warrant an operation of that size? With Koresh holding forth inside Mount Carmel, President Clinton replaced the ATF with the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Its task? To coax the Branch Davidians into a peaceful surrender whilst keeping the public on the government's side. Every day, the FBI came out and gave the federal spin on the day's news. It was a bizarre exercise in media control. And there was no contrary voice. We were getting one side of the story, and that was all. It was frustrating, I think, trying to get any information. And it just seemed all so unnecessary. Some believe that the FBI news reports were carefully worded so as to demonize David Koresh and his followers. As a reporter, I watched how Waco was being reported. Neutral words were not being used. It talked about a cult, not about a religious sect. Phrases like stockpiling weapons. There's no law in this country saying how many firearms anybody can own. It talked about a compound, not a residence. A phrase like assault weapon. I mean, that's a misuse of a military term. It called bunkers a building that was a walk-in cooler. A tornado shelter was also called a bunker. The FBI invented all this terminology, and the press just picked it up from the FBI. But other sections of the media believe the FBI's language was accurate. It's certainly true that the vocabulary used by reporters to describe the scene there uh, did have some value connotations. However, I do think that there was something most peculiar about the Branch Davidians. I mean, why else would people want semi-automatic weapons and why would they believe in what they did believe. There's nothing wrong with believing it, but they did run themselves uh, along the lines that we normally think of as being a cult. In Texas, the siege continues at the headquarters of a religious cult. It's now surrounded by 400 officers equipped with... The siege dragged on throughout March and April 93, and the FBI, who'd spent weeks negotiating with Koresh, began to resort to less conventional methods of persuasion. The Davidians were harassed during the 51-day uh, standoff uh, by psychological warfare tactics. And some of those involved horrendous sounds of rabbits being killed and slaughtered and particularly loud music. What strikes me about all these sort of allegations is that if that did happen and if they did use these tools, then they were singularly ineffective. Otherwise, David Koresh indeed would have found life unbearable and would have come out with his hands up. No one really knows the extent of the psychological tactics, but at dawn on April the 19th, President Clinton authorized the FBI's tanks to knock down the walls of the compound and fire in gas canisters in order to flush out the Branch Davidians. At this point, we're not negotiating. We're saying come out. Come out with your hands up. We have given them various ultimatums. We are going to continue to press and press until this matter is over. 
Two miles overhead, an FBI surveillance plane filmed the storming of the compound. What you see in the film is a carefully constructed plan, which is very well executed, with people moving and firing in coordination with the tanks. That doesn't just happen. That's planned. Military experts who've studied the film believe the bright lights illustrate multiple gunfire. When questioned in court, the FBI denied firing even one round into the compound. Hours after the gassing operation began, the building burst into flames in three different places. For six years, the FBI denied using anything that might have started a fire. However, in 1999, the Bureau admitted flammable tear gas had been used by their agents. When I saw the end of the siege um, and the building go up in flames, I was appalled. Absolutely appalled because I knew there were children in there. Yesterday's action ended in a horrible human tragedy. I was surprised that given the most obvious bungling at the start, that it would also end in a bungle. He killed those he controlled and he bears ultimate responsibility for the carnage that ensued. I have been told by a number of agents who were there that if the Davidians had walked out the first day that the building would have burned down because the physical evidence in the building, that is the bullet trajectories, this sort of thing, backed the Davidian story and not the government story. He had those fires started. He had 51 days to release those children. He chose those children to die. We didn't have anything to do with their death. I don't think that uh, there was a plan to kill anybody in Waco. I don't believe that the federal agents ever expected that, including those who made the initial raid. I don't think they expected they would be fired on themselves. So it seems to me it's far more of a case of negligence than of malice. The FBI has been non-helpful in providing any information that would help shine truth on what happened there. Because they're covering up. They're spinning the story. Despite the fact that official investigations cleared the actions of the ATF and the FBI, seven years later the charred remains of Waco still act as a breeding ground for conspiracy theories. For some, the question of who is to blame will never be answered. Clam Anderson's also back at 10.30 this time explaining satanic town planning. That's after we finish this conspiracy theory off. Waco upset a great many people, especially white males. It set in motion a great protest movement called the Patriot Movement. This has commenced firing. Ten rounds. In the eyes of the Patriots, President Clinton was solely responsible for the events at Waco. They believed that his enthusiasm for gun control endangered everything they stood for. Bill Clinton is a traitor. He has sold out the American people. He has trashed the Constitution. He has done everything to weaken this country instead of making it stronger. He has lied, he has schemed, he has done everything bad for this country. And among the people who were in the Patriot Movement were some people who had military training and wanted to get even. At Oklahoma, ex-soldier Timothy McVeigh did. On the 19th of April, 1995, two years to the day of the Waco fire, Oklahoma's federal building containing army recruitment, social security, and ATF offices was blown up. 168 people died. Timothy McVeigh, a former US soldier, was charged with the bombing. Influenced by the anti-government rhetoric of militia groups, he's on record as saying he felt a huge wrong had been committed at Waco, and with the help of his friend, Terry Nichols, he sought revenge. As details of the plot emerged, so did the conspiracy theories. They drove a lot of explosives a very great distance. They got a parking space right outside the Oklahoma City Federal Building, and they blew it up, and they got away. Tim McVeigh was a dupe. In order to be a dupe, you just simply have to have your buttons pushed by somebody who recruits you. He was recruited on the basis of patriotism, doing something for his country, and he responded to that because that was the way to get to Tim McVeigh on an emotional level. Well, I talked to one witness who said, he's as close as I'm sitting to you now, uh, to a truck in which there was McVeigh and there was another person who was not 
McVeigh's indicted co-conspirator. So, what do you make of that? He had no idea what the size of this bomb was or what was going to go on in that building. He thought this was a kind of symbolic reminder of Waco and what had happened at Waco several years earlier on exactly the same day. So if McVeigh was just a small cog, who else was involved? The US government had an undercover agent that had penetrated the conspiracy before the bomb went off and had somehow lost control over the operation, bungled it, and they have very assiduously prevented this from coming out. If you accept that, then the whole thing looks like a government conspiracy. But there's no hard and fast evidence. And in the case of the Oklahoma City bombing, I'm not convinced it's true. The story alleges that a female undercover ATF informant had infiltrated a conspiracy among white separatists to blow up government buildings. Government agents categorically deny any prior knowledge that the federal building was to be targeted. Some are not convinced. She told them who had done the bombing. She named them. But the FBI did not follow up her leads. They did not speak to the people that she named. The government could have stopped it. They didn't. Whether that was by design, I don't know. At some level, it may have been. On a more simple level, it was a sting operation that went bad. And that's why it's being covered up by the government. The Justice Department eventually disclosed it had an undercover informant inside a white separatist group. However, it continues to deny it knew anything about plans to blow up the federal building. The bomb was supposed to go off at 3 in the morning, I think. And it's actually interesting that there were ATF people out now that night. And um, there's a lot of evidence from the field in Oklahoma City that in fact they had been expecting some big event that night. There was a conspiracy, certainly involving two people, and perhaps involving more, to blow up the Oklahoma Federal Building. That's a fact. Whether there was a wider conspiracy involving the federal government itself, who got some of their own prized agents out of this building before it, got, uh, it was blown up, that is such obvious nonsense. In August 1997, Timothy McVeigh was found guilty of planting the Oklahoma bomb and sentenced to death. Since then, there's been a new conspiracy theory that the government itself blew up the federal building. They took out the people in the federal building in Oklahoma. That was done by agents of this government for the purpose of passing the anti-terrorism bill. I would not say that it was the US government per se that bombed the building, but it was small black operations within the Pentagon CIA using lower level cutouts such as Middle Eastern terrorists and eventually these rednecks and that was the kind of triple or quadruple decker operation that Oklahoma City was. It seems to me that there remains a possibility that there were other people involved in a conspiracy. On the other hand, there are those who believe there was a much wider conspiracy, that this was the federal government blowing itself up in order to introduce draconian powers to repress gun owners and other God-fearing people. Well, this is palpable nonsense. But if the Oklahoma bomb was designed to damage the US government, Oddly enough, it did the opposite. It offered the beleaguered president a political lifeline. The shock was so great, and Clinton's ability to bring the nation together was so extraordinary, I think it saved his presidency. He was able to speak for all Americans. This was the watershed moment in his political career, Clinton. It put him over the top. It got him elected the second time around. A year after Oklahoma, President Clinton and the conspiracy theorists were having a quiet time. However, flight TWA-800 was about to change that. An investigation is launched into why a jumbo jet exploded off the east coast Search of Search for the 229 people on board is continuing. Theory speculation seems to be terrorist-related. Well, I was at my beach house, and I was uh, coming out onto the deck uh, in the evening, and uh, I saw a flash. Then I saw a, uh, another flash rise from the area of the horizon. There was a ship's light in the same area of the sky, and uh, that flash seemed to go upward. 
At first, I, I saw what appeared to be an emergency flare, and then as I looked at it, I realized it was a lot more than a flare. I saw a streak of light, and I just thought, what is that? And bef before I could even form the thought... So I saw a flash, another flash. I saw an explosion. A huge fireball. On the 17th of July, 1996, flight TWA-800 took off from Kennedy Airport, New York, bound for Paris, with 230 passengers on board. Eight miles off the coast of Long Island, the 747 disappeared. Speculation as to what had caused the explosion was right. We know there was a catastrophic explosion. It's caused by some sort of a bomb. As a result of lax airport safety. Or something hit the plane from outside. It was a missile that shot it down. From a training exercise. Or a mechanical problem. It might be a problem with the aircraft, design fault. Or something in the cargo. It was the government, it was terrorists, etc., etc. In the era of the internet, conspiracy theories always start very quickly, and this is what happened when TWA-800 crashed. The answers to the tragedy lay under 120 feet of the Atlantic. The salvage operation would last 10 months. The investigation team's initial task, to find evidence of terrorist activity. But the first fragments yielded few clues. We thought we'd find something that we would tie it into uh, a criminal act. And as time went on, you know, each day went on, each week, each month, it, it just didn't take place. And we eventually started thinking otherwise. While the investigators continued their painstaking work, the rumor that TWA-800 had been hit by a missile was gathering momentum. Statements from more than a hundred eyewitnesses fueled the theory. There's no doubt that there were two missiles involved in this. One came from south to north. The other came from close inshore, within four or five miles of the shoreline, and came from north to south. Some felt that the government knew TWA-800 had been hit by a missile or missiles, but was covering up. Federal agents, however, provided their own explanation for what the eyewitnesses believed they'd see. This massive catastrophe happened and a plane breaks up at altitude and the fuel starts burning and explosions occur. I mean, things are flying off this plane, up, down, sideways. Some of the witnesses could have seen some of those events. But the missile theorists were not put off, especially when another piece of evidence emerged. The key piece of evidence was residue from the back of seat 8, row 18. It was a piece of foam rubber with some reddish-orange residue on it. It's right above the point where the missile first entered the plane. I had a test done to find out what are the elements in the reddish residue. That is consistent with an incendiary warhead. But again, there's a plausible explanation. There isn't going to be any fuel from a missile strike. The missile disintegrates. So if there is a missile theory, I actually don't believe that there's going to be any residue that's going to be left in a piece of foam that's fallen into the Atlantic Ocean and been there for a while. But in November 1996, the former press secretary to President Kennedy, Pierre Salinger, came out in support of the missile theorists. He alleged the rocket had in fact been fired by a US naval plane. I think there is a conspiracy going on because I think that uh, this is something that is uh, very uh, sad for the American uh, government to, to let people know that uh, they killed those 230 people by making a mistake. Pierre Salinger told the press he'd received the information from a member of the American Secret Service. The US Navy denies the allegation. What he says is total, unadulterated nonsense. But I remembered P.S. Salinger and watching him when he was the press secretary to the President Kennedy. And, uh, you know, I thought he was a... reputation was a good, a good honorable person. And uh, I was just totally flabbergasted. The 18-month investigation carried out by the National Transportation Safety Board reported the crash of TWA-800 had been caused by an explosion in the central fuel tank. The combined FBI-ATF laboratory conclusion was that one, there was no evidence of high explosive damage. With the US government standing firmly behind the conclusion of their investigation, some Americans believe they are covering up a huge military blunder. Their frustration is obvious. In terms of major media coverage of my investigation of the government, I have been 
absolutely, completely, totally shut out. There might be a lot of reasons for that um, uh, as to why the media has, is not uh, uh, grabbing this. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know how to explain that. Waco, Oklahoma, TWA 800. According to the skeptics, three examples of U.S. government cover-ups. The skeptics point to a history of official misinformation, hidden agendas, and downright lies, and believe no credibility can ever be given to the government line. Conspiracy theories will develop as long as the governments do not investigate it and inform in a forthright manner. Governments have a long documented history of deceiving the people, and I think that it's always a good thing for people who are not in power to question authority. And that's basically what conspiracy theories are. They're questioning, uh, you know, the, the official stories that we get. And so I think, you know, I hope they will always be around and I'm, I'm positive that they will. In just half an hour, Clive Anderson will be questioning political scandals, asking if they're really accidentally let out the bag or deliberately leaked to the press. Hmm. First, though, we sort out the alien aircrafts. Washington, D.C. To the Patriot, a shrine to American history and cradle of democracy. To the Paranoid, a city filled with secrets and cover-ups. In fact, the capital of the United States is probably home to more conspiracy theories than anywhere else on Earth. Pretty obvious why Washington D.C. would be a supposed site of many conspiracies. I mean, it's the seat of world power. It is sexual. The actual grid of the city was laid out according to some sort of Masonic principles. It is Masonic. It seems to be a center of almost occult power. It is satanic. It is Washington D.C. The greatest story never told. So, what is it about Washington that attracts such theories? To guide us around the city, local resident and conspiracy expert, Michelle Green. I think that the workings of Washington, D.C. are pretty mysterious. We know that uh, Congress meets in the Capitol, and those of us who live in the city know that there are other buildings where these various senators have offices and hold meetings constantly at taxpayer expense. Very few people really know what goes on. People have a good reason to be suspicious of the government because there's been a record of uh, deception on the part of the government with, with, in relation to a lot of major uh, events like the Vietnam War, uh, assassination of President Kennedy. Watergate, uh, Iran-Contra. Wake up when the Branch Davidians were slaughtered. When you have this endless stream of uh, untruths or uh, you know distortions, falsehoods, whatever you want to call it, from government, naturally people are going to lose their faith and lose their trust. Washington's conspiracies have even passed into the mainstream, with TV programs such as The X-Files presenting a vision of just one secretive government department, the Federal Building of Investigation. 
The building to the right of us right now is the FBI building, which has been connected to just about any conspiracy on a national level that is imaginable. Uh, from watching movies, one would think that the FBI does absolutely nothing but pursue the mafia and chase down rumors about aliens, although, in fact, I'm told that the FBI doesn't even have a division like the X-Files. They are completely unconcerned with the paranormal. I don't think everyone necessarily believes them when they make that claim. American citizens have good reason to be suspicious of the FBI. In the 1950s, under director J. Edgar Hoover, the Bureau kept thousands of files on citizens during the communist witch hunts. It's rumored that with the information held in this archive, the FBI had the power to destroy anyone from movie stars and senators to police chiefs and even presidents. Accusations of skullduggery are nothing new to Washington. Some believe a mysterious secret society has been at the heart of the capital from the day it was built. People who designed the city designed it according to Freemasonic beliefs in the sacred power of geometry. And it may be that they meant for those shapes embodied by the city itself to imbue the area with power. Washington, D.C. is laid out in a series of pentagrams, and a pentagram is a Masonic symbol. Conspiracy theorists believe there were sinister motives among the founders when they set up Washington as a power base from which they could rule the world. Many of the founding fathers were Masons, and a lot of the very preliminary designs that were approved may have been Masonically influenced. If, if you look at what's been known as the giant phallus, the Washington Monument, as the center, it's kind of in the middle of a pentagram and the city spreads out from that point. Now I know that in Masonic and occult lore the uh, five-pointed star and the six-pointed star are both very important symbols and these kind of recur again and again all over the city when you look at maps the way streets bisect one another. Sinister shapes, occult symbols, and could the architecture even be called satanic. When you take a look at the obelisk, which is 550 feet high, they didn't just drop it on, the, on top of the, the grass, it would fall over in some sort of earthquake. They generally put 20% of the structure beneath the ground. 20% of 555 is 111. Add them together, it's 666. The pentagram is a satanic symbol. The Pentagon is a satanic symbol. And apparently Masonic symbolism is there to see on every dollar bill. Take a look at the pyramid on the back side of the American dollar bill on the left. It says Novus Ordo Seclorum, the new social order of the ages, the new world order. And then it says Anuit Coeptus, meaning our enterprise is crowned with success. These are Masonic symbols. The Masons are often uh, uh, subject of a lot of, of conjecture and conspiracy circles. And if uh, in Washington, D.C. in particular, this is no surprise because most of the United States presidents, uh, J. Edgar Hoover, uh, you know, most senators and, and representatives are currently or have been at some point in their lives Masons. Fourteen presidents and 18 vice presidents five chief justices and the majority of the governors of the states, to be precise. In fact, Bill Clinton was one of the few presidents not to be a Freemason. Well, in Presidents Next, Clive Anderson dips into the murky waters of political scandals. That's another conspiracy theory after this one. But there's one Washington building that has more conspiracies attached to it than any other. Located in Hell's Bottom in Arlington, Virginia, just over three miles from the White House, the Pentagon is the largest government building in the world. It's headquarters of the Army, Navy, Marine Corps and Air Force, and is so shrouded in secrecy that its very name has become a byword for sinister plots and dark designs. I'm not sure exactly what's going on there at any given moment, and neither is anybody else, which makes it the center of many Washington, D.C. conspiracies. Um, 
unlike the major branches of the United States government, the military really isn't obligated to disclose everything that it's doing. It, there are a lot more safeguards protecting its secrets. So if there's a giant warehouse containing DNA samples from every American, they could very well be in the Pentagon. Its secretive nature has meant that over the years, the Pentagon has been associated with a number of extraordinary events. From allowing the CIA to test LSD on volunteer GIs in the 1950s, to spraying germs on unwitting citizens in a US subway during a military experiment. But the Pentagon insists its role is benign. Well, there are a lot of things that go on here. I mean, it's, it's very serious work that's done here. Uh, it's, you know, keeping, uh, as we see it, the free world free, with the help from our friends, of course. But uh, th there has to be a great deal of uh, secrecy involved in that. And that's just, that's just the nature of diplomacy and um, military organizations. This military complex gets hundreds of billions of US dollars. And although the Pentagon accounts for most of what it does with these public funds, one area of its budget remains a secret. That too has spawned its own conspiracy theories. What they call the black budget in the military is uh, that portion of military expenditures which go to secret projects. Things like the stealth bombers, not secret anymore, but for a long time that was the most secret project. Who knows what's uh, being worked on now, but basically what it means is the area of our military budget where our tax dollars go, and we don't know where they're going. We just have to wait until there's another war. Of course, there are a lot of black projects that are conducted here, and you know, 20 years from now we can read about them, but in the meantime, uh, they're secret, and uh, it's necessary to, to have that kind of uh, secrecy to protect uh, uh, the workings of the, of the Department of Defense. A number of now famous black budget projects have become public. The U-2 spy plane, the B-2 stealth bomber, and the SR-71 Blackbird. But one US government area which remains secret gobbles up much of this black budget. It's found over 2,000 miles from Washington at Groom Lake, Nevada. There are definitely places on Earth which are secret and kept secret by the governments. Area 51 in Nevada, for example, was a place whose existence was denied until very recently. Did not even appear on maps unless you had access to a Soviet satellite photograph which showed that indeed Area 51 was an air base that existed secretly in the, in the desert and has been used to test fly advanced craft. This top secret military base was set up in the 1950s to develop black budget projects. But it wasn't until 1987 that the US government admitted Area 51 was there. Since then, the complex has generated extraordinary conspiracy theories. Oh, there's a massive cover-up. Uh, this is America's top secret. I was just up there, we saw three different craft, uh, a giant orange orb streaking across the, the sky at about 15 miles south of, towards the base. Uh, for about three seconds it disappeared, then appeared again. Uh, these are not conventional aircraft. These are anti-gravitational flying disks. They have the capacity to do maybe 20 Mach and stop on a dime, which would just shatter the human brain and body against the side of the, uh, of the craft. There were lots of strange things, things rising up, hovering, shooting straight up, loop-de-loop, -loop, you know, doing things that normal conventional aircraft uh, cannot do. So there is some evidence that there's something very uh, unusual going on at Area 51. Conspiracy theorists believe that the U.S. military has acquired alien flight technology and is using it to build the next generation of military aircraft. There is a group, though, that comes by uh, periodically and wants us to uh, show them the space aliens that uh, allegedly we have in the basement. But uh, the basement's under construction and we haven't found any space aliens down there. So perhaps the Pentagon is not working with aliens. But it's been rumored it has been experimenting with mind control to create the perfect military machine. The best soldier is a zombie robot. If you can control a human's mind, a soldier's mind, you can turn them into a zombie robot. That would be a new one on me. I mind control uh, 
Uh, I, I don't know of any work being done on that. Uh, uh, but then again, I showed up for your interview, so maybe there is something to that. <laughs> Conspiracy theorists say that experiments, whether on aliens or zombie soldiers, take place deep underground. Do they exist? Yes, they undeniably exist. They've got to put the missiles someplace, but are they there for uh, surveillance purposes and do the aliens live there and, and this and that? Maybe not. It's true that many sensitive US military operations are buried deep underground, protected from foreign satellites and nuclear attack. And it's not just the army that have a subterranean bolt hole. The president, too, has his own five-star bunker. Deep in the forests of West Virginia lies what used to be the most closely guarded of US military secrets. Set in six and a half thousand acres, the Greenbrier Hotel is one of the most exclusive resorts in the world. But underneath is the secret green briar. Behind 25-ton nuclear blast doors is a network of tunnels containing everything needed to support hundreds of members of the US Congress in time of nuclear war. Above ground, it's about as elegant as you'll find in the world, and below ground, it has all the, um, the uh, physical comforts and lifestyle comforts of a World War II submarine. place where the government would go to do uh, the business uh, in, an, in the event of a nuclear attack, uh, germ warfare attack, and so forth. And, you know, this, this, this place is there. It can be uh, seen. Uh, you know, you can, you can go there and, and see for yourself that, that, that it in fact exists. For conspiracy theorists, the underground world has yet another dimension beyond bunkers, alien resting places, and presidential shelters. Buried deep down are giant supercomputers, designed to keep tabs on worldwide communication. In charge of this surveillance is the NSA. The National Security Agency has a program called Echelon. They monitor, or, or are alleged to monitor, because none of this information is public, all communications going in and out of the United States. The NSA spies on electronic communications of virtually anyone they want to. And basically its job is to record every conversation, every email, and so on and so forth. It can be a private individual, a commercial company, a government agency, uh, anywhere in the world. What they do is they then search through these uh, communiques for key words. Um, who knows what they are? Communism, I don't know, who knows? But, you know, when, if you uh, make a phone call and you use one of these key words, your phone call is going to then be selected out by the computer and maybe analyzed by an intelligence analyst or by another computer. So, you know, this idea that Big Brother is actually listening to your, your conversations and monitoring your communications is actually true. Not everyone agrees with this analysis. The NSA is the part of the American intelligence structure that deals with code breaking and protecting American communications against other uh, countries. 99.9% uh, .9 of what NSA does is focused on threats to Western security such as uh, Iraq and Iran and North Korea and the spread of nuclear weapons and terrorism and the like. But some people are not convinced that this level of surveillance is in the citizen's interest. Much of this high secret uh, surveillance is carried forth under the rubric of national security, but I and, and many other people increasingly think that the, the real truth is it's carried out under the guise of national insecurity. It violates our human liberties. Washington the Pentagon, even Area 51. We may not know what really goes on there, but at least we know they exist. But there's one place which, for all we know, might only exist in the minds of dedicated conspirologists. There's no hard evidence to go on, just an extraordinary history. On the 19th of February, 1947, American explorer Rear Admiral Richard Byrd of the US Navy flew to the South Pole. It's said that when he came back, 
he wrote down what had happened on this expedition. Conspiracy theorists have interpreted this record as proof that Richard Byrd had indeed discovered an entrance to the center of the Earth. The hollow Earth theory uh, is that the center of the Earth is hollow with an empty space and that people or creatures inhabit this area inside the center of the Earth. And that inside the Earth uh, are live some sort of super beings. Some say they're demons, others have said no, they're just uh, the basis for stories of gnomes and uh, trolls. They're tall, reptilian humanoid creatures that are very advanced. There's a hole in the Antarctic, supposedly, where uh, these creatures fly out of and fly back into, and there's a whole uh, allegedly super civilization living inside the planet. And between that inside area and the exterior of the planet are tunnel systems or cave and cavern systems that basically vein the entire planet. Once you accept the fact that the Earth could be hollow, you can take any of the mysteries and use that as your basis and you'll find that there are no longer mysteries. Skeptics of the hollow Earth theory claim that Rear Admiral Byrd's notebooks have been misinterpreted. I think you can read his statements and find a much more mundane explanation for them, but stated in poetic terms. I believe he said something about the land beyond the South Pole is a place of wonder, a secret place of wonder, something like that. What he is meant to have said is, I'd like to see that land beyond the pole. That area beyond the pole is the center of a great unknown. And this was enough to trigger the thought in some minds that the Earth could be hollow. So how likely is that? Since we have not yet sent a probe down to the center of the Earth, um, we still are basing all of our knowledge on the interior of the Earth on theory and hypothesis. And just because one person is a scientist doesn't mean that his hypothesis or theory is any better than somebody else. Adolf Hitler is supposed to have believed in the hollow Earth theory and regularly sent his troops into the Antarctic on exploratory missions. And the late 8th Earl of Clancarty, member of the British House of Lords, also suggested that aliens might be living beneath our feet. I think they all originally came from outer space, and I think that at some time when there were some very ancient civilizations here, uh, and possibly during a time when there was a catastrophe, they met, went inside, because there's an enormous number of tunnel systems um, all, all around the Earth. Lord Chief, how would you react to accusations uh, that you're dotty and eccentric? <laughs> Uh, well, I think the answer to that is that very often the people whom one regards as slightly dotted because they've come up with some original ideas, very often turn out to be right. Even present-day governments are fueling the conspiracy. The government has thrown many hints. They've, they've taken photographs and given them to key people who investigate these things and then ridicule them later, and it's all a misinformation game. The Hollow Earthers also claim US legislation that prevents citizens from exploring caves is specifically aimed at stopping them reaching the Earth's center. You're not allowed to go into a cave or a natural opening in the Earth without a federal cave permit or a federal cave expert with you. And also, any locations of caves that are otherwise on government property or public property that the public doesn't know about, they cannot, through the Freedoms of Information Act, sequester the government for the information as to where those caves are. So there is a concentrated effort to keep people from exploring the underworld. So if you go along with this, why are governments keeping their knowledge of the hollow earth secret? The big cover-up is if the people found out that there was a tropical paradise inside the earth, they would migrate and it would end the new world order and they would have to start all over again. So, life in the hollow earth, aliens in caves, Masonic symbols in architecture, phallic symbols in abundance, are they all just the products of a fevered imagination? Paranoia is a problem amongst conspiracy thinkers, but not all conspiracy thinkers. A lot of them are very diligent and rigorous and try to go only where the evidence leads. Unfortunately, it's the more sensationalistic theories that 
attract the most attention for obvious reasons. On the other hand, there's the famous saying that just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to get you. Coming up next, this Saturday night over on UK TV documentary, they're back in the 90s with satire at its best. Have I got 1992 for you over there? But here next, here on People, our news is of political scandals. This is UK TV people on a Saturday night. Later on, it'll be midnight. Right now, though, it's 11 o'clock, and that means an appointment with the President. In the main, Americans are deeply patriotic. With the 1960s and 70s, a series of political scandals shook the faith of American citizens in the institution of government. Here in the States, the whole conspiracy theory industry definitely started with the assassination of President Kennedy roughly 40 years ago. I think up until that time, uh, you know, we, we had sort of been indoctrinated to believe that our government was always acting in our best interest. The assassination was investigated by Chief Justice Earl Warren. He concluded that JFK had been killed by Lee Harvey Oswald, a lone assassin. He was killed, murdered by this oligarchy. The Warren report is totally fictitious. When people started to question the Warren Commission, you're questioning Earl Warren, you're questioning, therefore, you know, the authority of the Supreme Court, the authority of the president who appointed him. Outrageous conspiracy theories mushroomed. JFK was murdered by the oligarchy of evil, the American Illuminati. JFK revealed the secret of the flying saucers to Marilyn Monroe, and therefore he had to be murdered. He's not really dead at all, that he's living on a Greek island. Sort of the theory on top of the theory is that uh, there was a massive cover-up. Conspiracy theories reached a new level of intensity six years later, when Richard Nixon became president. The United States was at war with communist North Vietnam. Well, the Vietnam War was another traumatic national event which caused a huge breakdown of, of uh, the sort of fabric, the, the link that connected the people to the government. And then in the, the early 70s, uh, the so-called Pentagon Papers were released, written by employees of our military, uh, which basically proved that what was really going on, uh, going on in Vietnam was not, in fact, what we were being told, because we had been lied to by our government. Golly, how could anybody live through that? Anti-Vietnam War protests overshadowed President Nixon's first term in office. He took a tough stand. To win his second term in 1972, President Nixon had a fight on. But had his campaign team's involvement in a break-in months earlier been known, the result might have been very different. In June 1972, Five men burgled the headquarters of President Nixon's Democratic rival at the Watergate office building. Elements of Nixon's campaign broke into the Watergate Hotel uh, to uh, either plant information or to, uh, to get information about the Democratic presidential campaign in 1972. The burglars were caught, the Senate investigated, and just months into his second term, Nixon got involved in a cover-up, and he might have got away with it. Certainly we've seen no hard evidence that the president had advanced knowledge of the bugging. Uh, we do know uh, that the president was warned by some of his top staff aides as early as December. Washington Post reporters Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein cracked the story. Woodward and Bernstein were dismissed as conspiracy theorists by the White House and treated in that way by uh, much of the press for a long time. And I think probably that's how it would have ended had it not been for Judge Sirica, uh, who used his powers as a, as a judge to force this thing open. 
Judge John Sirica presided over the Watergate hearings. Nixon's role soon became apparent. Now, no one ever implicated Nixon in actually ordering the break-in, but he uh, got involved in getting the CIA to stop the FBI or to try to stop the FBI from investigating Watergate. And he was caught on tape saying that. When transcripts of White House tape recordings were released in 1974, they proved Nixon had been involved in a cover-up. Time was running short for the president. The House Judiciary Committee voted to throw him out of office, but Nixon beat them to it and resigned. I never meant to lie. Au revoir. We'll see you again. So this is goodbye. People realized that the most powerful trusted people in this country could not necessarily be trusted. And Watergate was really the last time that the media uh, affected government in, in, in any kind of constructive way. You know, by getting, helping getting the president out of there, they helped change the system a little bit. Americans were outraged by Watergate and the president's role in it. But conspiracy theorists feel the real culprit was a secret network of all-powerful global intelligence agents. The octopus. It's all a little group that uh, knows how to use assassinations, uh, revolutions, rioting, different kinds of manipulation to further its own power interests, uh, which are, are multinational and personal and have to do with the power of the group, the octopus. And it's nothing to do with democracy, it's nothing to do with elections. Ken Thomas believes that President Nixon crossed the octopus by trying to co-opt the CIA's power for himself. The closer you look at Watergate, the more you realize that, that Nixon was essentially at war with elements of the octopus. Nixon was everything that history makes him out to be, a real seedy, manipulative, uh, kind of conspiracy-oriented figure. Uh, but he was at, at war with something else that was the same thing, but only better at it. The octopus also spread its tentacles in many later political conspiracy theories. It certainly wasn't on President Jimmy Carter's side. Standing for a second term in 1980, this peanut farmer from Georgia was facing Republican Ronald Reagan. The stakes were high. Trouble was brewing in Iran. Its ruler, the Shah, was backed by America, but he was ousted by the followers of Ayatollah Khomeini in 1979. Anti-American sentiments ran high. In November, Iranian students stormed the U.S. Embassy in Tehran and took over 50 hostages. An incredibly embarrassing situation for the United States to have these hostages uh, that they couldn't free and could do nothing for. For months, President Carter tried everything to get the hostages released. As he failed on the diplomatic front, his popularity plummeted. Since mid-November, we and the Iranian officials have been discussing with... Secretary A military rescue mission to Iran in April 1980 failed. Eight American Marines were killed. Time was running short. Presidential elections were in November. President Carter's impotence to free the hostages played into the hands of his opponent. But Ronald Reagan suspected Carter had something up his sleeve. Reagan's people really believed that Carter had a secret plan to free the hostages, that he was going to wait until October, the month before the election, to free the hostages. And this would then be the October surprise. There's no evidence that Carter actually planned an October surprise. The hostages were not released, and Reagan won the election. Well, there's never been a more humbling moment. But conspiracy theorists think that Reagan's team did more than just take advantage of the stalemate in the hostage crisis. Some say they had even prolonged it. The Reagan campaign negotiating illegally and independently with the Iranians not to release the hostages, but to hold the hostages until the election was over, thus ensuring Carter's defeat. Do I believe that uh, he conspired? Uh, I'm talking about Ronald Reagan and George Bush to have this happen? Yes. Were they working with the, the boys in Iran, the terrorists? Yes. A second Christmas in captivity for the hostages came round. Conspiracy theory, no hard facts. 
One thing is fact. I, Ronald Reagan, do solemnly swear... On the 20th of January, 1981, within hours of Reagan's inauguration, news came from Tehran. I had received word officially for the first time that the aircraft carrying the 52 American hostages had cleared Iranian airspace on the first, first leg of a journey home and that every one of the 52 hostages was alive was well and free. Very funny timing. There's other explanations for it, of course. You know, it could be that uh, the usual explanation is that Ayatollah Khomeini just wanted to humiliate Carter as greatly as he possibly could. Maybe that's true. Whether Ronald Reagan used or prolonged the hostage crisis for his own ends is unclear. But one strange anomaly exists. The allegation wasn't investigated by the mainstream American media. Indeed, under Reagan, the citizens' distrust of politicians almost evaporated. People have a very limited tolerance for this sort of stuff. The average citizen can't handle all this stuff. If it's all gloomy bad news about what a whole your country is, this is depressing, you know. So you've got Sonny Ronnie. Ronnie comes along with his big sunny smile and says, we can forget all this. Hey, let's go back to the 50s. <laughs> and along with that general orientation, the American state tried to push the media back in the box. Dispatches weren't being reported, they weren't going out on the wire, and the message came down loud and clear from the Reagan administration. We don't want this sort of stuff. The October surprise allegations against Reagan were practically ignored by the US media. But two years into President Reagan's second term, a scandal occurred that even Sonny Ronnie couldn't keep out of the press. Again, the United States enemy number one, Iran, was at the heart of it. Pro-Iranian militants took several Western hostages in the mid-1980s. The hostage nightmare had come back to haunt Reagan. In November 86, a Lebanese magazine claimed that the Reagan administration had sold weapons to Iran in exchange for hostages. The president tried to play it down. The only thing I know about major shipments of arms, as I've said, everything that we sold them could be put in one cargo plane and there would be plenty of room left over. Your credibility has been severely damaged. Can you repair it? Well, I imagine I'm the only one around who wants to repair it and uh, I didn't do have anything to do with dis if damaging it. Do you think the American people would ever support weapons to the Ayatollah Khomeini? We weren't giving them the Ayatollah Khomeini. The, it's a strange situation. As I say, we were dealing with individuals. But a lot of American people just simply don't believe you. I believe that he knew much more than he admits to. The problems we have with Iran and the hostages, this is really against everything that we really were hoping would happen. It got worse. Not only was the administration selling weapons to Iran, the profits were funding Contras in Nicaragua who were trying to destabilize the democratically elected Sandinista government. They weren't supposed to be negotiating with the Iranians, certainly weren't supposed to be selling arms to Iran, which was a terror on our list of terrorist countries. We're not supposed to be funding the Contras. Illegally obtained money was used to fight an illegal war. It was just completely illegal. With Watergate, there was a direct link to Nixon. With Iran-Contra, no such link to Reagan. But in July 1987, America was riveted to the TV screens to hear the testimony of Marine Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North. He was the White House aide in charge of running the Iran-Contra scheme. The main question, did the president know? I never personally discussed the use of the residuals or profits from the sale of U.S. weapons to Iran for the purpose of supporting the Nicaraguan resistance with the president. Reagan escaped, but by a whisker. There was no resignation. The arms deals with Iran had started as early as 1985, but they were only reported much later. I mean, Iran-Contra was not believed uh, until Reagan and his attorney general came out and admitted that it had happened. It's sort of the government leading the press rather than vice versa. For some conspiracy theorists, Ronald Reagan's narrow escape proved that he had powerful friends. Were they part of the octopus? The people that make the covert connections to Khomeini's regime, people that actually sell them the arms and take the money back with them, these are the people who make up the octopus. So why had the so-called octopus let Reagan survive? Some say his tough anti-communist stance was far more in line with their own agenda. 
And in another twist, conspiracy theorists claim that another political figure became ensnared in the octopus. Governor Clinton's office. Shipments to the Contras left without hindrance from the home turf of future president Bill Clinton. I know that an airport in eastern Arkansas, the MENA airport, was used to stage the flights down to Honduras and Nicaragua for aerial resupply of the Contras, dropping M16 rifles and other weapons out of the bottom of a um, C-130 transport plane. Um, and this was done when Bill Clinton was governor. Some arms were shipped from the airport. Only very few think that Governor Clinton knew about it, but some do. Bill Clinton was kept fully informed about it, and one of his key aides, his, his driver, went on two of the flights down to Nicaragua, parachuting weapons, um, on Bill Clinton's uh, insistence. Other researchers found flaws in the driver's statement, and only very few believe in this version of events. I think given the huge battery of lenses and forensic scalpels that were deployed against Bill Clinton, if there had been something really suspect or to hide about his times as governor and about MENA Airport, we'd know about it by now. But this didn't stop conspiracy theorists spinning their own explanation of why Clinton could have got involved in Iran-Contra. It was Bill Clinton basically cozying up to the power elements that were in the White House at the time, the Bush, Reagans. Could this have brought Clinton closer to the presidency? I remember during that election, they had what they were called the seven dwarfs. There were seven different, very viable candidates for the Democratic uh, spot. And it goes to Clinton, the only one of all seven who had this direct role in making sure that this particular aspect of the Iran-Contra thing never surfaced. Before the book was closed on the Iran-Contra conspiracies, a final chapter was added. A Pulitzer Prize-winning reporter uncovered a link between the CIA, the Contras, and L.A. drug dealers. He was quickly dismissed as a conspiracy theorist. What I had written was that these crack dealers in South Central L.A. were working with the Contras to finance the Contra war. What the spin was, was that I was alleging a conspiracy by the CIA to flood black neighborhoods with crack, which is well, never what the story said. But that was the tact the government and the media took to try to knock this down. And I found myself defending myself against things that I had never said. I was called a conspiracy theorist. I was called a Sandinista sympathizer. I was called a defender of drug traffickers. I was called just about every name in the book. Eventually, Webb's own paper withdrew the story, a move that was seen as confirming Webb's facts were flawed. I was very disappointed, I was very discouraged, I was very angry, and I went public and I said, you, my editors are nuts, essentially. But two years later, the CIA went public with some interesting facts. The CIA did, a, did an extensive internal investigation, and they released a two-volume report that said basically, yes, we had collaborated with drug traffickers during the Contra War, Yes, we knew they were drug traffickers. Yes, we knew they were drug traffickers from the get-go. Gary Webb feels vindicated by the CIA report. But do the government and the media really actively conspire? Journalists are not conspiring to cover up the story. They just have a relationship with the power structure that means they tend to start seeing things through the eyes of the power structure. They spend their time with these people. They're friends. This is their world in Washington. It's, it's, not even that, it's not even that they're kowtowing to authority. They come to believe it. We get only the news that fits their agenda, and their agenda is world government. And they think what we're doing is mad. It took Gary Webb over two years to feel vindicated. Over two years in which he was written off as a conspiracy theorist. With the arrival of the internet, the hope of controlling the news agenda and discrediting journalists for years has become much more difficult. Bill Clinton's presidency felt the full effect of it. What was once rumour is now spread and uh, instantly in, in a flash of a few seconds. And people like Matt Drudge. My name is Matt Drudge. His website. I published the Drudge Report. His website became crucial to making what would have taken months to uh, trickle down happen in minutes. There certainly is room for people who are, are just citizens to report and to have commentary. Matt Drudge reports breaking stories throughout the world and played a major role in the biggest Clinton scandal. 
within days of the uh, rumour even surfacing about Monica Lewinsky, Matt Drudge was on the internet saying that there was a stained dress, that there had been late night uh, sexual telephone calls, that unbelievably naff gifts and presents had been exchanged, uh, and that the, and, and they had the chronology right as well, and every single one of those details did turn out to be true. If this story ends up bringing down a president, and if it started in my Hollywood apartment, that's a heavy load, uh, psychologically, to carry. But I go where the stink is. I just follow the, uh, the story and wherever it leads. Matt Drudge broke the Lewinsky story in January 1998. Within days, Hillary Clinton went on the offensive on US television. The great story here for anybody willing to find it and write about it and explain it is this vast right-wing conspiracy that has been conspiring against my husband since the day he announced for president. Now, the use of the word conspiracy made a lot of people think she'd gone a bit nuts and that this was a hugely exaggerated claim. Actually, there really was a vast and right-wing group of people who were determined to remove him from office. Part of this right-wing conspiracy, the story goes, took place before the Lewinsky affair became public. Clinton was under oath in a case of sexual harassment brought by a female employee from Arkansas. Clinton supporters say anti-Clinton lawyers set a trap for the president. They claim independent investigator Kenneth Starr was behind it. The name of an intern, Monica Lewinsky, was unexpectedly thrown at the president. The blood drains from Clinton's face. He goes pale and panics, thinking, clearly, how on earth do they know about that? What the Clinton camp thing happened is that Kenneth Starr's office got on the phone and said, look, we've heard that he had this fling with this woman, Monica Lewinsky. Ask him about it when you're asking about his pattern of behavior with women employees. He'll be very surprised if he denies it. We'll have caught him in a perjury trap because he'll have lied under oath. And that's exactly what happened. He could have got away with adultery and even with lying to the press. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. But he lied under oath, and Congress moved to impeach him. Clinton was impeached for um, his capers with a cigar. I mean, that was all they could get him for. They tried very hard to get him for everything else they could think of. None of it stuck. Whether he lied about it or not, it's really not the same issue as whether you lied about you know, ordering the cover-up of a break-in of your political opponents. It's very, very different. The Lewinsky story has generated its own raft of conspiracy theories. I believe that, uh, that Monica Lewinsky was, was set up by elements of military intelligence that Ian Fleming belonged to and that many people who are regarded as propagandists for the CIA or whatever uh, belong to. So the Lewinsky matter can be seen as a military intelligence operation that only stopped after Bill Clinton agreed to refund the Star Wars program. The story goes that Clinton was lukewarm about Reagan's Star Wars missile defense program. Did this mean he'd threatened the plans of the dreaded octopus? When the facts about the most powerful people in the world are kept from a skeptical public, outrageous conspiracy theories flourish. Rightly or wrongly, the conspiracy theorists, the reputation of US democracy, as personified by the president, is now in tatters. Some extremely radical and controversial conspiracies to follow here on the UK TV people, including the thought that America created the HIV virus to wipe out the population of the third world. Body panic is next. Stand by. Welcome to UK TV People. We've got a new world order coming up in half an hour. How's that for planning? Clive Anderson sorts that conspiracy out after he sorted this very controversial one. Alabama in America's deep south in the 1930s. 
70 years earlier, slavery had ended, but black people were still suffering poverty, oppression, and discrimination. When you speak of Alabama uh, in the 1930s, you, you're going back to the days where very few blacks enjoyed a freedom in comparison to the white man. The blacks were more or less sharecroppers or field hands. Gonna shine my troubles over, Lord, I done made it to the promised land. In a small rural town, the U.S. government began to think the unthinkable and do the unforgivable. In the 20th century, there was a 40-year-long experiment conducted in Tuskegee, Alabama, in which black men who had syphilis were a part of an experiment to watch what syphilis did to the body if no medicine was uh, prescribed. In 1930s Alabama, syphilis, a sexually transmitted disease, had reached epidemic levels. Somewhere in the neighborhood of 33 to 34 percent of reproductive age individuals were apparently positive for syphilis. At the time, there was no cure. In order to study the effects of untreated syphilis on black men, the U.S. Public Health Service set up the Tuskegee Syphilis Study in 1932. The thinking was that African Americans reacted to syphilis differently from European Americans. The thought that since European Americans were intellectual, that it attacked their brain, and that African Americans who were physical syphilis attacked at their heart. Some black doctors and nurses volunteered their professional services, hoping their help would further the cause of proper medical care for their patients. I was told that it was a study that was going to be made of people who had syphilis. And always having been interested in research, I was very delighted to be a part of it. But the involvement of black medical staff didn't protect the men from exploitation. Uh, they didn't get their consent, not to even mention their informed consent. They didn't even get any consent whatsoever. In total, 623 black men were recruited for the Tuskegee study. They had two groups of them. One group was a control group, and these men did not have syphilis. And the other were persons who had syphilis. The men all came from the Tuskegee area. Many of them did not even know what syphilis was. They were told that they had bad blood and that they should continue coming to the health facility to be studied, you know, and, and treated. And they were from rural areas and had little or no formal education. You know, they had to sign and, and many of them would come up and instead of signing, they'd make an X and uh, then it meant I had to get two other people to uh, verify their X. These men were under the impression that it was a health program. They'd get a chance uh, to see a doctor and they believed that. To encourage the men's participation, their families were promised the large sum of $50 in the event of their death. It meant a lot because uh, they could be dressed properly or, or buried properly in a proper coffin, you know. And uh, in those days, it paid adequately for a decent funeral. Throughout the men's lives, the progression of syphilis in their bodies was monitored, and at their deaths, autopsies were performed. But by 1947, 15 years after the start of the study, unknown to the men themselves, a cure for syphilis had been found. Even after the invention of penicillin, when there could have been relief for these syphilitic men. It wasn't given because that would ruin the experiment. At that point, continuing the study of untreated syphilis in the Negro male was utterly wrong. No one knows exactly how many men died in the next 20 years as a direct result of not being treated. By the 1960s, a new era of civil rights was dawning and questions began to be asked. My first knowledge was around 1969 when a physician in the agency told me about the study and um, indicated that he felt uncomfortable with regards to the way in which the study was done. The study was finally ended in 1972 after it was exposed as unethical. When I finally read in the paper, I was angry. I was hostile. I felt like I had been trapped into something that I had no knowledge of and I had no control of. It was sustained by the government, supported financially by the government, 
and they merely turned their head because they considered black people expendable and of lesser people. On the 16th of May, 1997, 65 years after the study began, President Clinton publicly apologized for what had happened. We can stop turning our heads away. We can look at you in the eye and finally say on behalf of the American people, what the United States government did was shameful and I am sorry. For the assembled survivors and relatives of the deceased, it was an emotional day. It was a very, very, very tearful ceremony. Uh, I, I looked at the survivors, I thought about my father, I thought about the atrocity, I was bitter, and I was happy. A group of people used as a medical experiment, a conspiracy that really happened. But could it happen again? The legacy of the Tuskegee study is primarily in establishing the safeguards that we have for doing research today. What happened to them will not happen to anyone else if our laws are followed. But despite such assurances, the terrible legacy of Tuskegee has left America's black community suspicious. There are those who still believe the authorities are out to get them. The development of the AIDS virus is the result of a century-long hunt for a contagious cancer that selectively kills. Whenever I think there's a disease that disproportionately affects the black community, the reality of our history with um, governmental experiments and so forth comes to bear on how we're going to interpret um, this new affliction. AIDS, the modern plague. More than 18 million deaths and an estimated 34 million people infected with HIV. No one knows where the disease came from, or do they? One of the conspiracy theories is that the virus, HIV, is a biological warfare agent. According to all the scientific evidence, the vaccine given to gay men in New York City and blacks in Central Africa in 1974 was the vaccine that delivered AIDS to the world. In other words, AIDS is no accident. Vaccines given to vulnerable communities were infected with HIV. But if this is true, it begs the question, why? To support the intentional theory of AIDS, all one has to do is look at the outcome. There appears to be a 50-year paper trail with respect to concern as a national security priority that the overpopulation of Africa was an issue that would have to be dealt with. 73% of HIV AIDS patients in the United States are black and Hispanic. This is after half of the gay population has been killed. Looking in Africa, you see a more horrific and uh, equally racist picture. But medical experts pour scorn on such conspiracy theories. I know, just as, as other uh, workers in the field know, that n no such program ever existed. You don't want to uh, expose someone to a biological agent and then hope that they will die in 12 years. It's ridiculous. So, if the HIV virus wasn't manufactured to target specific groups, could it have been unintentionally spread by polio vaccines? In September 2000, journalist Ed Hooper claimed that scientists working in the Belgian Congo in the 1950s grew their polio vaccines in chimpanzee kidney cells, which unknown to them, were infected with the HIV virus. Impossible, say the scientists. Uh, it has been shown that the process of developing the vaccine uh, would inactivate uh, the virus of AIDS even if, if, even if it were present. If you look at the distribution of the vaccine and the distribution of HIV, you'll immediately say, oh, I don't think so. Such accusations must be answered, not just for the sake of my personal reputation, but because if such accusations are allowed to stand, then the public begins to believe them. The question remains, where did HIV come from? The consensus is that it came from chimpanzees. In scientific terms, it crossed the species barrier. The 
uh, HIV virus began its history in Africa. Uh, the estimate made by scientists is that it transferred from chimpanzee to human in about 1930. How this happened, no one knows. What we do know is that HIV is wreaking havoc. Unless a vaccine is developed worldwide, another 100 million people will become infected in the next 10 years. The problem with conspiracy theories is that until they're proved beyond a doubt, they remain just that, theories. Nothing illustrates the frustration this can cause more than Gulf War Syndrome. If I was a veteran who had come back from the Gulf, and I had been well, fit, in the armed services, and over the next few years I started to develop illnesses, I would look for explanations. When you look at all the factors involved and the way that we've been treated um, afterwards, um, there is most certainly uh, a cover-up going, uh, going on. We don't know if she's going to be here tomorrow, next week, next month, next year. We take each day as it comes. On the 16th of January 1991, a multinational alliance declared war on Iraq and more than 700,000 coalition troops were sent to the Gulf. To protect them from chemical and biological weapons, troops were given a series of vaccinations. They thought nothing of this until they came home and some of them began to fall ill. Before I went to the Gulf War, I was extremely fit. I was marathon runner and when I came back, um, I started up my running again and the furthest I could go was about five miles. There is no doubt at all that going to the Gulf has had a deleterious effect on the health of UK and American servicemen and women. There is therefore a Gulf health effect of Gulf illnesses. But could it just be post-traumatic stress disorder? Military officers, doctors, journalists have noticed repeatedly that modern warfare is followed by a period of um, illness in troops. If you send young men to war, some come back with psychiatric and psychological injuries. But that alone does not explain the Gulf War illness effect. Gulf War illness is characterized by a bewildering array of symptoms. I, I'm starting to lose sensation in my fingertips. If I'm drinking water, trickles out the corner of the mouth like it does with a stroke um, victim. Some veterans believe their children, born disabled after the conflict, have also been affected by Gulf War syndrome. She's classified as chronically ill. If you took her feed away, then she would die. She'd die very quickly. Millions of pounds have been spent on research in both Britain and the United States. But as yet, there are no answers. I mean, there's been several theories brought forward. There's been the mixture of drugs that we was given. There was the depleted uranium that was put on the ends of the shells. I think it is highly implausible, highly unlikely, that there is a single cause of Gulf War illness, uh, either known or unknown. I very much wish we did know, because it would be so much easier in dealing with the veterans who feel themselves rightly, in my view, in many ways, to be aggrieved because they feel the government hasn't done enough. With no definite answer, veterans are left to theory and rumour. The strongest suggestion being that the medication they were given was in some way to blame. Many of the veterans that we've interviewed do believe that they were used as guinea pigs in some unnamed scientific or military experiments. The authorities insist their only interest was in the safety of the troops. Had our soldiers not been fully inoculated against the full range of chemical uh, and biological weaponry, I think we would have been guilty of gross negligence. But there's another far-fetched theory about the troops' medication. Gulf War Syndrome is indeed the HIV envelope with one gene missing. As the troops were embarking to go to the Middle East to allegedly defend democracy in the world, they were being injected without knowing it with a new experimental AIDS vaccine. The Ministry of Defense have uh, denied that any experimental vaccines 
uh, was given to us. I've never used any war veteran as a guinea pig for anything, and nor has any other minister in the British government. A major stumbling block to the research is that many of the medical records were destroyed as the troops left the Gulf. I'm quite sure the people who disposed of those records wish they hadn't. But my own view is that this was a bureaucratic decision, administrative decision done at a very low level without much thought to the consequences and um, regrettable but not sinister. But for the veterans it suggests a cover-up. We know our government's work, they can always lose bits of paper, they can always lose records. They've been doing it for years. I mean, there was no question of a conspiracy or a cover-up or anything else. Without an answer, the veterans are stuck in limbo. Until they find out what's wrong, they can't claim compensation or even get appropriate treatment. As yet, no one will even confirm that Gulf War Syndrome exists. I think it's important to be precise because if one does endorse Gulf War Syndrome, one is again suggesting that this is a single illness with a single cause. And all along, all the research suggests this is a multitude of problems with a multitude of causes. I mean, these people have come back, some of them are very ill. There's no shadow of doubt about that. Some of these symptoms are very perplexing. The best medical advice in the world has so far failed to come up with an answer to what it is. All I want to do is really see my daughters grow uh, into adult life. And I don't know if that's going to happen. Providing answers to complicated questions is the role of medical research. Let us be in no doubt about what we are witnessing today. A revolution in medical science whose implications far surpass even the discovery of antibiotics. In June 2000, the success of a major research project was announced, which promised us more answers than ever before. The Human Genome Project, I think you could say, is just the most important scientific project ever carried out, if you could say, with relevance to human life. So what is it? The Human Genome Project is a collaboration to map the precise composition of our genes, a human blueprint. They tell us that we'll be able to identify what causes diseases, many diseases, genetic diseases, and because of what this thing called gene therapy is, we'll be able to treat these. It will kind of usher in a new era of medicine in which um, we'll all have drugs sort of personally designed according to our genes. Unsurprisingly, something which smacks of a brave new world is attracting the conspiracy theorists. I would not want the research to bring us to a point where I would have been screened out before I had a chance to live. One promised benefit of the Human Genome Project is it will be possible to screen embryos for genetic defects. This raises huge ethical questions, mainly about the rights of parents to decide whether a disabled child should be born. I don't think you know the hell that many parents go through because of terrible throws of the genetic dice. All they see is the images of disability that are in the press and the media, and most of them, almost overwhelmingly, are negative. It's within that climate that you know parents come to make these choices. Scientists involved in the project take a somewhat different view. Disabled people have a pretty rough time, and I think uh, the fact that we don't want or want to decrease the number of future disabled people born doesn't mean that you know we won't love a child who's disabled. There is an important argument that if you um, introduce a policy to, to uh, reduce or eliminate a condition, um, that may lead to increased discrimination against people who have that condition. The most extreme aspect of this conspiracy theory of genetic selection is that parents will not only seek to eliminate disability, they'll want to use genetics to create a super baby. Opinion polls say that a lot of people, um, you know, if they could choose the sex, the height, the appearance, the, uh, you know, the IQ of their child, they would think that this would be a lovely thing to do. The Frankensteinian notion that we can create a super race of stronger, more powerful, more intelligent type of babies. To play that level of God with no risk is absurd. If you want to say it's uh, going to be very intelligent and it's going to be uh, very attractive and it's going to be very healthy, I think you could say all parents would like that. So what's wrong with it? Disabled activists say the whole premise is wrong. All babies are perfect people. 
they may come in different uh, guises, but they are perfect people and part of the whole jigsaw of the world. So is the genetic engineering of the next generation fundamentally flawed? To look for perfect children is, is looking for utopia, and utopia just does not exist. And anyway, I'm not sure I would want to live in utopia. The fertilised egg which produced me with my shortness also produced me with uh, you know, a, an above average intelligence. Um, if you're asking, did I want to be the result of another fertilised egg, I'm not sure. If it meant I was tall but stupid, probably not. Darwinian selection has produced people and, uh, you know, like Mozart or Shakespeare or Winston Churchill. So I think genes can do wonderful things. Supporters of the Human Genome Project think the project's critics are overreacting. To not benefit thousands, tens of thousands, millions of people because we're afraid of one thing going wrong is a very big mistake. It certainly will raise a lot of problems, but it's also so wonderful and miraculous uh, that things might work out better. It is uh, the stuff of science fiction. The fact is also that it's increasingly the stuff of social reality. Conspiracy theories about the body are hard to ignore because even a grain of truth means they have the potential to affect us all. Your body is your most private space. None of us wants medical science to turn it into public property. It's an unrealistic goal and it's an immoral goal to eliminate all suffering and difference. I'm all for interfering with nature because nature is very cruel at times. People want a simple answer even if the simple answer is not an answer at all. There is not a waking moment that I am not aware of the fact that I have AIDS. The scientists I know uh, cannot keep a secret longer than five minutes. And the problem with trust is like with virginity, that once you've lost it, you can't get it back. The fear that things will come upon us in the night, that things will take our bodies and do with it what they will, have been fears that have been with us since we came out of the caves. on UK TV people we take on another conspiracy theory with a man who calls himself Clive of Anderson truth is that so much which is called conspiracy theory is actually conspiracy fact. Not all of it, but enough to show that um, the people that run the world are not the ones the news media tell us do. Good morning everyone. It is a scene of great chaos in downtown Oklahoma City at this hour. There's been a tremendous explosion at the Alfred Murray Federal Building told now has confirmed that it was a bomb. That On the 19th of April 1995, the people of Oklahoma began to count the cost of the worst terrorist attack on American soil. Quite apart from the human loss, the bombing galvanized the paranoid psyche of those who believed that this was the work of a new world order. The new world order is uh, a belief, I guess you'd say, the conspiracy theory of the new world order is a belief that um, on the part of usually right-wing groups, I think, that uh, there is sort of a secret organization of, of uh, maybe the United Nations or, or something like that that uh, plans to impose kind of a one world government on the entire planet. The New World Order wants to create a world currency, a world government, a world army, a world religion. 
And it's not of Christ, the Buddha. It's not of the Muslim faith. It is a satanic order. I think the most important first thing to say is that a, a policy for a new world order does exist. It's often poo-pooed and made fun of in the mainstream press, and yet the reality is it's there. Uh, George Bush, when he uh, went in and you know bombed Kuwait, that's the first thing he started talking about. For institutions of freedom have lain dormant. The United Nations can offer them new life. These institutions play a crucial role in our quest for a new world order. Their agenda is control. Control of our currency, control of our families, of our freedoms, of our religions. They want it all. There's nothing that you have, or ever had, or ever hope to have that they're not planning to taking away. They want it all. There are many aspects to it, but um, the key uh, agenda, and I would, I would emphasize, you know, we talk about conspiracies. What I'm talking about is not actually a conspiracy, not at its heart. It is an agenda. It is an agenda for the um, centralized control of planet Earth and all its people. Um, where the conspiracies come in is in manipulating that agenda into reality. The heart of the New World Order conspiracy is the belief that ordinary life is somehow controlled by a mysterious secret society, intent on pursuing its own gains at the expense of the rest of us. If this is true, who are these people, and do they really have the power to control our lives? World order theories are sort of what I call unified field theories because they try to bring every event that could ever possibly happen under one giant conspiracy theory. And usually behind the conspiracy, according to the theory, is uh, some secret group, some secret society. And uh, depending on who you talk to, it's usually a version of what's called the Illuminati. Now, the Illuminati were a real organization that did exist uh, in the 18th century in Europe. They were sort of kind of like the Masons. They kind of grew out of the Freemasonry movement, um, sort of even more secret than Freemasons. And uh, a lot of people think that they, well, they probably did have something to do with the French Revolution and, and that sort of thing. Um, but, uh, you know, according to historical records, they lasted for about 14 or 15 years, and then they were busted up by the the police and that was the end of them. They were a subversive group, gone. The conspiracy theory would have you believe that the Illuminati have continued to exist to this very day and maybe even existed prior to the 18th century, in fact going back thousands of years. The New World Order, it seems, goes back to the very beginnings of civilization itself. When you get back into the ancient world, you find a stunning common theme. Gods with advanced knowledge that created ancient uh, advanced civilizations which modern archaeology and uh, history still cannot explain. These gods, which appeared to be um, of, a, of a reptilian genetic stream originally, interbred with humanity, creating hybrid bloodlines which were a fusion of the gods and humanity. I tend to think some of these facts that ex fact, facts or factoids that exist only in conspiracy theory probably have no basis in fact at all. But I like the theory about the world being descended from extraterrestrials who came here about 4,000 years ago, interbred with some human beings and have been ruling the rest of us ever since. I like that theory because it has a science fiction eeriness and charm to it. Now, ancient Babylon appears to have been the center for this network and these bloodlines in the ancient world. When it moved across to Rome, that's when we had the Roman Empire. 
When it eventually moved across to London, the great British Empire expanded these bloodlines to the Americas, to Africa, to Australia, through Asia to China. And then when you start to do the genealogy to complete the circle of the people in positions of power today, like the presidents of the United States, for instance, and this is um, mainstream genealogy, not conspiracy research genealogy, you see the same bloodline coming up over and over and over again, and you realize the obsession the Illuminati have with bloodline, then pieces seem to fit. This Illuminati, which is sort of, uh, you know, a group of people who are smarter and better and faster and quicker than the rest of us, are pulling the strings. Now, if they've really been around for two, three, four, five thousand years, you kind of wonder why they haven't managed to, you know, take over the world yet. It's been a long time. When you um, put all this information together, um, the way the same bloodlines turn up in the positions of power, not just now, but way back in history. Um, I've identified with different for, uh, sources of genealogical research a bloodline that starts in ancient Sumer and Egypt and comes up to um, George W. Bush and the Bush family and, and, and many other people in the world today, Al Gore as well. Um, and the people in it are some of the great names and changes of the world throughout human history of the last 5,000 years. It's unbelievable. Conspirologists see Illuminati symbols everywhere. It seems the Illuminati have been using the same symbols for thousands of years, and yet many of us are totally unaware of their existence. If you take a look at the back side of the dollar bill, it'll say Novus Ordo Seclorum, the new social order, and they have the pyramid. And that has nothing, not a damn thing to do with the United States of America. I was going to take a look at, you know, a bill. And you can take a look on the back side of the bill and it'll say, uh, here. You can hardly see it. But it's Novus Ordo Seclorum, the New World Order. It's what Hitler envisioned. It's on the back side of the United States dollar bill. The Eye of the Pyramid, which is also called the Eye of Horus, is the Eye of Lucifer. This is what we are facing. Just to give you an idea of how black is white and topsy is turvy in relation to our perception of what's going on compared with what is, um, in New York Harbor is a lady holding a lighted torch, a Statue of Liberty. Statue of Liberty, land of the free. That's what most Americans, 99.9% .9 of them, believe that stands for. In fact, that was given to New York Harbor by French Freemasons who knew that it was an Illuminati symbolism of we control the show, we're telling you, but because you don't know the secret language and we've given you another version of it, freedom, you don't know what's going on. But a lot of that might have had to do with the fact that a lot of people in our government have belonged to the Masonic movement. Uh, including the founders of, of this country. You know, George Washington was a Mason. There's a famous picture of him wearing his Masonic apron. And a lot of the signers of the Declaration of Independence were Masons. And I think 16 presidents, I'm not sure the exact number, but I think 16 different presidents have been Freemasons. So, you know, I mean, I guess when you, there's that many Freemasons in the government, uh, it's not surprising that you see these Masonic symbols every now and then. Now, does that mean that there's some Masonic conspiracy to take over the U.S. Or, or the world? According to conspiracy theorists, this hybrid bloodline is active today within the major political and corporate institutions of the world. Through shadowy organizations such as the Council on Foreign Relations, the Bilderberg Group and Trilateral Commission, the Illuminati seek to preserve their bloodline and control the world. This is one of the best documented things in conspiracy literature. The number of presidents who have belonged to the Council on Foreign Relations is absolutely staggering. Working backwards, 
I can't remember all of them. Bill Clinton is a member, the president before him, George Bush was a member, the president before him, Ronald Reagan was a member, the president before him, Jimmy Carter was a member, and so on back. I don't know how many presidents they missed, but they got most of them. You have Richard Holbrook, Bill Clinton's peace envoy, Bill LeBurr Group Trilateral Commission Council on Foreign Relations. He answered to the Secretary of State at the time in America, Warren Christopher, Council on Foreign Relations Trilateral Commission. And the Defense Secretary in America he answered to, William Perry at the time, Bilderberg Group. They answered to the President Bill Clinton, Bilderberg Group Trilateral Commission Council on Foreign Relations. Why um, do, did the media not tell us that? Ask me, ask me why the Dirty Telegraph didn't tell us that. Because it's owned by Conrad Black, who's an inner core member of the Bilderberg Group. Why didn't the Washington Post reveal, which, which I, I've been able to find out, that all these people are connected by the same organizations? Because the Washington Post is owned, at least officially, by Catherine Graham, Bilderberg Group, Trilateral Commission, Council on Foreign Relations. The three television networks in America, ABC, CBS, and NBC, are uh, owned and controlled by members of these organizations. But how do you get to join Bilderberg, the most prestigious of the secret societies? We tried to pick people who were going to have influence. That was the whole point of the thing, was to allow people who were likely to influence policy to learn more about the world in which they were living and to meet people whom they wouldn't have any opportunity to meet in the ordinary course of events. Ever since the Bilderberg Group first met in 1954, the exact purpose of the talks has never been fully explained. The delegates meet in secret for three days of discussions, but nothing they talk about is ever revealed afterwards. The secrecy, or privacy it's better to call it, was well observed, although of course inevitably because the meetings were private, they gave rise to conspiracy theories on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, the American conspiracy theorists said it was a plot to undermine the United States. The European ones said it was an attempt to destroy left-wing governments all over Europe so that America could run Europe. But of course it was neither. Why uh, the Trilateral Commission, the Council on Foreign Relations, the Bilderbergers, and similar groups, why are they so secretive? I have pondered and pondered and pondered on that question, trying to think of alternatives to the conspiracy theorist's usual explanation. They're plotting nothing but unmitigated evil against the rest of us. And I think part of the answer is they are plotting unmitigated evil against the rest of us. And part of the answer is they're plotting things they don't want anybody else to know about for the same reason that all of us have things we'd rather keep private. No business allows people come in to come in off the street and examine their books and what research they're doing and so on. And there's a certain amount of secrecy that's just innate in the fact of organization. You don't want people outside the organization to know too much about what the organization is doing, even if it's harmless. Conspiracy theories would seem to be about secret societies covertly running the world. But in addition to this, conspirologists also develop theories about overt organizations like the United Nations and NATO. It's a very common belief on the part of right-wing organizations, especially in this country, that the United Nations is some kind of uh, military political organization whose purpose is to uh, to, to take over and to, to basically stage a military invasion of the U.S. and just use that as a springboard to establish this one world government and that NATO uh, is, is the force by which they're going to do this. The New World Order is housed right here at the United Nations. It uh, is global government. Ein Volk, Ein Reich, Ein Führer, one world, one race, one ruler, is what Rudolf Hess talked about when he introduced Adolf Hitler. This is Hitler's dream come true. This is a nightmare. This is the tombstone upon all sovereignty for all nations for all time. The United Nations must fall for freedom to live. Where institutions of freedom have lain dormant, the United Nations can offer them new life. These institutions play a crucial role in our quest for a new world order.
an order in which no nation must surrender one iota of its own sovereignty, an order characterized by the rule of law rather than the resort to force. The United Nations may be the red herring. Uh, it was kind of like, this was the shell that long has been pointed to. Look at this. These are the dangerous threat. And, you know, I think fortunately the United Nations has proven to be more incompetent than evil. But, you know, all the focus up until recently has been on the United Nations and quietly groups like the uh, World Trade Organization were basically taking over control of international business agreements. Organizations like the International Monetary Fund and the uh, World Bank have basically been taking control of financing in the world and making dictates of how countries are to develop, uh, all into the interest of international corporate structures. And you realize, well, maybe all this focus on the United Nations was because this is the one that was never going to really amount to anything. I believe it was one of the Rothschilds said something to the effect once, give me control of a nation's currency and I don't care who, can, who makes the laws. Because once when you control the money supply, once you control the currency, you do have the ability to decide how the government behaves because they do have to react to uh, monetary pressures. I mean, money talks. When the IMF loans monies to countries, they say, well, what is your collateral? They said, well, we've got the rainforest. So, well, just turn over the rainforest to us. We've got minerals. Well, just turn over the minerals to us. And they cut down a tree and give them money. And those people are impoverished, paying the interest on the tax. And if they can't pay it, then the United States taxpayers are saying, well, we've got to uh, come up with just a little bit more money. For what? For the globalists? For the Hitlers, for the elite, for the Illuminati, that's insanity. So is this the ultimate Illuminati agenda? Are they controlling the global economy to control the world? Hundreds of anti-capitalist protesters are in Washington to try to disrupt meetings of the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. At every street corner around the IMF and the World Bank, the demonstrators have set up human chains to stop the meetings taking place. The demonstrators say the IMF and the World Bank are contributing to global poverty. But at the top of today's agenda on the two global organizations is how to reduce the debt of the world's poorest nations. The demonstrations against the IMF and all this were, were a reaction to this centralization of power and, and sort of a rebellion against the idea that economic policy, global economic policy, can be shaped by a small group of people who have vested interests. In shaping it and in a way that's sort of the definition of a conspiracy even when discussing things like the united nations and nato and even the wto the imf the world bank i don't think it's productive to focus on these shells as though they are the problem because like it or like it or not this phenomenon is going to exist whether it's under these names or if they create new organizations um, i think the real bigger issue is that who are these organizations working for, and what interests are they serving? When you don't have your freedom, you don't have your family, you don't have your nation, you don't have your right, then you are living as a slave. We're now in a situation where the hidden is becoming visible. We now have a window of time to throw a spanner in the works. And that means humanity's got to open its mind to a much greater possibility of what's going on than it has had the ability or the desire to do so far. Because if we don't throw a spanner in the works, and we can, um, then the new world order will become physical reality. I absolutely believe we're moving to a new world order, not necessarily the one that anybody has planned.
we seem to have arrived at the stage thanks to the computer and internet revolutions where information available to human beings is doubling approximately once a year which means we're having more and more dramatic unexpected totally unpredictable social changes of all sorts there has always been a uh, authoritarian structure which has to some degree controlled people and you could argue that in the past 50 years it has become more powerful albeit also more subtle on how they've done it but it's always existed and to say that there isn't some sort of secret society mystical element to it would really ignore the reality of the situation. There's certainly a huge human toll that's extracted by the misuse of, uh, cons of paranoid thinking. You know, I mean, in, in a way, I, I sort of draw a distinction between paranoid thinking and conspiracy research because, you know, there are real conspiracies that happen. We'll be taking on the aliens in your next one, so stay up with people for more conspiracy theories next and all night long. These people have an agenda. Is it satanic? Yes. Do they want a world government? Yes. Are they willing to kill for it? Yes. Have they killed for it? Yes. They're not happy with controlling people's bodies, but they want their very soul. And more than that, they want Satan's representative on Earth, the Antichrist, to be master. The final book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, says the Antichrist will come among us. It doesn't tell us when or in what form, but according to some evangelical Christians, Satan's minions are already here, creating havoc in everything from rock music and education to art and government. We're trying to warn the world that there is a very corrupt, debauched, depraved group of men whose goal is to bring in the great unified world kingdom under their hellish master, Lucifer. They believe in their Lord, Lucifer. They expect to have a satanic society. There's no question about that. The Bible says that in the last days there will be ten world rulers. These ten men will be of one mind. They will give all of their strength unto the beast. 666. Oddly enough, one group who regard this particular satanic conspiracy with some contempt is the Church of Satan. Certainly the world is not ruled by a group of men who are trying to pave the way for the Antichrist. The powerful men in the world are always de facto Satanists because they're the people who understand how power functions and how the human animal functions. Their goal is not for some mythical antichrist, it's simply for their own profit. And that's always been the rule since time began. The Satanists say they don't worship a devil or an antichrist, merely the carnal human with all his deep, dark desires. They reject the notion that they are the instruments of evil. As they see it, far more worrying is the power-hungry nature of fundamentalist Christians, whom they believe have concocted the whole satanic conspiracy for their own agenda of world domination. Christ is the answer! The devil. And don't tell me they ain't one. And you can look around and see him everywhere. Yes, he is the answer to the world's ills today. Christianity in the past was linked to the state power. They did have the ability to kill anyone who was a heretic. 
I think that many Christian groups today would like to regain that power and crush anyone who opposes them. They are obviously acting in concert because they have certain goals and aims which they wish to put over culturally on the citizens of the United States. They would like to control the government. They would like to control the school systems. They would like to put their sort of autocratic uh, religious beliefs over on people who have no wish or no desire to have them. But isn't Christianity a religion of love and forgiveness? I don't believe there's a conspiracy of Christians trying to take over the world and, and force everybody to become a Christian. There are some Christians who do hope and pray that through political means they will be able to instill more Christian type values within society. That's certainly a far cry from trying to take over the world. Christ is the answer. Yes, he is the answer to the world's ills today. However, to such are the levels of mutual distrust and suspicion that conspiracy theories flourish on both sides. On the one hand, the evangelists accuse the Satanists of seeking world domination. On the other, Satanists claim the evangelists want everything their own way. Let all witchcraft, sorcerer, Fly from ahead. The battle is akin to an exorcism, each seeking to eliminate the other. But in reality, both sides need the other to survive. Deliver him, O oh Lord. And by thy innovating mercy, he may be freed and liberated from all sin. According to the Satanists, in their search for world domination, evangelists have used occult manifestations to frighten people. I think the, the wave of uh, hysteria about some sort of national satanic conspiracy started with a TV show done by the reporter Geraldo Rivera. He claimed to have documented vast instances of child abuse and kidnapping and ritual abuse and, and baby eating and all this crazy stuff. In 1984, this belief in a satanic conspiracy was triggered when rumors of satanic child abuse emerged from a nursery school in Southern California. Claims of a network of tunnels beneath the school where satanic rituals were performed sent shockwaves across America. A court case later said the teachers were innocent of all charges, but the thought had been planted in many minds. There's, you know, no legal proof that they did any of these things, but you know, among the conspiracy theorists, there's this belief that they were uh, in a satanic cult and they were committing ritual abuse of kids. Uh, that helped spur the big national satanic conspiracy theory. And it led to this almost cottage industry in experts on Satanism. As half-truth, gossip and rumor spread, the hysteria began to grow and the stories became more fantastical. They used stun guns on children. I saw children with shock collars put on, so if they disobeyed their trainer, they were instantly shocked. As a child myself, I remember a night march. I fell down in the mud crying, and my mother came over in her military boots and kicked me and said, get up. You will get up. You won't stop. I saw children drugged, hypnotized. I saw them strapped to tables. I saw children buried alive and told if they ever told again that they would be buried forever. It seems inconceivable that such atrocities could exist without people knowing about them. The reason Svali gives for no record of any investigation is that the police, teachers, government officials and social workers were all members of the cult. However, for those who've explored how hysteria spreads through society, this is just an indication of how victims back up their claims without having to provide solid evidence. A conspiracy theory is, in a sense, a self-fulfilling narrative. Once you start to tell it, in order to explain why there's no evidence, you have to keep expanding it. Somebody is destroying the evidence. It's in the interests of mysterious, powerful people that you can't identify, but somebody higher up doesn't want it to be known. That's why you can't prove it. However, those making the claims say their biggest obstacle is persuading other people to believe them. Society's denial is also one of the greatest help to these groups because your average person does not want to believe that these things happen. We don't want to hear about horror. We don't want to hear about abuse. We don't want to hear about ugly things. And often, the average person will turn their eyes away from these things. It's almost as if we believe if we don't see it, it doesn't exist. 
something has happened to these people. I don't think they're all crazy. I don't think they're all lying. I don't think they're all in it for the money. I think something has happened. The question is what? Whatever happens nowadays, it can provoke an hysterical response all around the world. Now we have global communication, we have television, we have the internet, we have mobile phones. And if something happens in one region of the world, however tiny, however remote, instantaneously, it spreads all over the world. So the stories of panics, conspiracy theories, rumors, which might have taken years to circulate, now are instantaneous. And while the United States was tied up with its satanic panic, the hysteria crossed to the UK. Ritualised abuse of children by devil worshippers. Ritualistic abuse. Allegations of satanic ritual abuse. Children on a Rochdale housing 17 estate. 17 children have now been removed. Taken from their parents. Ritual abuse on Orkney. A network of satanic followers. Tunnels beneath this cemetery. And Satanism. Satanism. Satanic, satanic abuse. abuse. During the 80s and ending pretty much by mid-90s, there was something we call the satanic panic. And it was a time when fundamentalist Christianity was promoting the idea that Satanists had infiltrated the culture and were kidnapping women and breeding babies for sacrifice. The material that was used in order to start the hysteria in the UK all used material which was sent to them, communicated to them, from contacts in the US within the right-wing fundamentalist camp. The stories began with sexual material, that they were being sexually abused, that they were being raped, that they were being fondled. Then religious imagery came in, that crucifixes were used to molest them, that they were witnessing infant sacrifices. The government subsequently found no evidence of satanic child abuse. But as events in the UK and the US showed, the satanic conspiracies caused actual trauma to the people caught up in the frenzy. This was serious primary damage that was done to family situations, children taken away from their families, childcare workers and parents being imprisoned. Many of those cases have now been overturned in the courts. Um, nonetheless, that is irreversible damage. Long regarded as the devil's work, rock music sends shivers down the spines of all good fundamentalist Christians who set out to combat its supposedly satanic influence. The Parents Music Resource Center was set up in the US to draw attention to what they regard as Satan's lyrics and images on CDs. They got together in councils which were almost literally war councils to plan and plot how to take the United States back from what they felt was a conspiracy in the other direction. Because they felt so vividly that they were fighting a conspiracy, they became a conspiracy of almost a military scale. Your music, rock and roll, is a satanic music. You make the music go black and you hear Satan speak. The, the people behind the PMRC were mostly Washington wives, Republican and Democrat, including Tipper Gore, wife of Al. Also joining the crusade were the fundamental Christians of America. I want to see music that advocates a kid kill themselves. Banned. I want to see music that says you go out and kill your parents. Banned. In New York State, Pastor Brothers has taken this one step further. He's founded the Freedom Village, an institute designed to wean impressionable youngsters off guitar riffs and suggestive lyrics. We have been called deprogrammers of young people. Well, at first I didn't like that term. The more I got to thinking about it, the more I did like it, because I think somebody better start deprogramming these young people. Not everyone is convinced that rock music will spawn armies of Satanists and sex slaves. Music is to entertain people. It comes in all different shapes and sizes. I may not like it, you may not like it, but that doesn't mean you have to uh, create a legislative climate that keeps that music from uh, being available to the people who want to enjoy it. It is only music. There is no devil, and it's not going to hurt you. But when claims of backward masking emerged, it seemed fundamentalist Christians finally had the proof they needed that the Antichrist was communicating through music. Backmasking became part of the anti-rock 
satanic conspiracy theory in the early 80s. The idea was basically that satanic record executives would plant evil messages backwards on albums. The idea was that if you put a message backwards on a record, it would have some kind of satanic sorcerous power over the legion of uh, susceptible fans, making them, for example, smoke drugs, rebel against their parents, or, worst of all, possibly turn homosexual. It first reached the media as a high-profile issue with the attempt to prosecute a British heavy metal band called Judas Priest. The band were accused of subliminally embedding the words do it, do it, do it in their album Stained Class, which the prosecution alleged provoked a suicide pact between 20-year-old James Vance and 18-year-old Raymond Belknap in Reno, Nevada in 1985. This case is about mind control, the manipulation of the minds of consumers for the objective of making money. It's interesting, though, they didn't specify do what, do your homework, I don't know. Is there anything there that could be considered a subliminal message? Even though Judas Priest were acquitted of all charges, the question of subliminal messages remained on the agenda. The strongest argument that backmasking doesn't work is the fact that if it did, you can guarantee the church and state would have been using it for centuries. I think the hysteria over the so supposed link between, you know, the supposed Satanism in, in rock music uh, has in fact spurred on a lot of rock groups to become more and more quote unquote satanic. It's a great marketing tool, it's a great symbol of rebellion. So, uh, you know, is there some sort of sinister conspiracy behind it? No, I, I think that, uh, you know, it's something that's created by the people who fear it. But from the Beatles to the Beastie Boys, few bands escaped the accusation that they were working hand in hand with Satan. The PMRC said that ACDC stands for Antichrist Devil's Children. Now, if you had told that to the members of ACDC, with whom I worked extensively, they would have fallen off their chairs laughing. I've always studied the, the, the lyrics, and I found that only people deeply into Satan worship and occultism would write these things. They also made astonishing claims about Kiss's name. They said Kiss stands for Knights in Service to Satan. And where would Satanism be without Ozzy? I don't think Ozzy Osbourne is a Satanist. I mean, he's a showman. And this is what a lot of people don't understand. Most notoriously, he's supposed to have bitten the head off a bat. Though, if he gained any black magical powers from that, they were probably outweighed by the fact he then had to have uh, rabies jabs. You look at their albums, someone put those symbols there. Someone had those incredible images. Someone gave them the words. And the bete noir of almost every American parent, Marilyn Manson. It was amazing to see the Christian picketers at the, at the Marilyn Manson concerts who were so, you know, worried about, you know, let's face it, a rock star. Uh, the kids, they're not interested in the old stage stuff. Now they want to get deeper. They've been desensitized by music, by television, and popular uh, culture uh, into the most horrible, filthy depredations. Absolutely, this is bringing uh, people into uh, such a mindset that the Antichrist will walk in with ease. He's got his whole substructure. The infrastructure has been prepared for the coming on the stage of the Antichrist, ultimate evil. So, if or when he comes, how will we actually recognize him? I believe he could come uh, as a man of, of great statesmanlike appearance. Will he be a world leader? He may. Will he be a religious leader? Possibly. But certainly he will be a man that people will trust. Prince Charles has been uh, put up as a possible candidate for the Antichrist. You know, I don't think so. I think he's a little bit too, too goofy to be the Antichrist myself. George Bush. Henry Kissinger. Bill Gates. I've heard also that it's a 27-year-old American living in the uh, Southwest. Which narrows it down to about 30 million. Of course, all good things come to an end, including the world. And the return of the Antichrist has generated no shortage of prophesizers diligently on hand to warn of imminent disaster. I cannot count how many Christian doomsayers there are.
in American society at this point in time. It is a very, very big thing to teach that the Antichrist is soon going to rise, that the end of the world is just around the corner. There's always been people and groups who, whether it's based on the Bible or some other uh, text or, or, or belief, believe that the end of the world is, is about to happen or that there's some secret group that's trying to bring about the end of the world for their own sinister purposes or the end of civilization anyway. So really apocalyptic ideas and conspiracy theories are very closely tied together. If the book of Revelation is to be believed, the end of the world will be quite an event. There will be the four horsemen of the apocalypse, each one bringing greater terror than the one before. The pale horseman is, I think, the most terrifying because he brings with him death. The belief that the world's about to come to an end has always been very popular, and I don't know if I'd say there's the people who are espousing these beliefs are in it for the money. Maybe some are. It makes a good story, makes good movies, like The Omen. But perhaps it's not the end of the world we should be worrying about. Rather, the conspiracy theories that generate the fears and distrust in society and the people who use them to justify their existence. There have always been moments where certain things in culture have caused people to be very tense about their lives. This is when they have looked for a conspiracy theory to explain everything. And what's happened is that sometimes people have used the conspiracy theories to go after various different groups of people, Jews, blacks, Catholics, Satanists, even Christians. Um, and so it's something that can be very dangerous. No matter how much you question a conspiracy theory, once it's become embedded in the belief system of a person or a cult story, they will find ways of rationalizing it. They simply expand the boundaries. And far from dumping down the conspiracy theories, both the evangelists and the Satanists continue to add fuel to the fire, because it's in their interest to do so. Without an enemy to fight, there's little meaning to their existence. The game is about over. Because of all the events of the Bible, there are only a few events that are left to occur. But those events are so dramatic that I literally almost cry to consider the horrible gravity of the things that are going to occur. Are Satanists conspiring to take over the world and influence the culture? Some might say that. I think that the human future will be directed by many Satanists, although the general culture may never know that they've had their hands on these things. These people have an agenda. Is it satanic? Yes. Do they create wars? Yes. To bring about peace. And that peace is deadly. Because that's going to require all of us to surrender everything we've got to this evilarchy, this oligarchy of evil for all time. Thank you.